My life has always been great. Well, mostly. Let me explain. It all began when I was 16 years old. My family and I moved into an old house in Georgia. We had moved from North Carolina due to my father's job needing him to be at the company's office in the state. It wasn't much of a deal at first. I hadn't ever been social with others, which caused me to have little, if any, friends growing up. My sister took it much harder than I did. She was supposed to be doing so much at school. She was very popular and had a very abundant amount of friends. She complained throughout the whole process from when it was announced to weeks after we'd moved in. My mother adored the home that we were moving into. It was big and fit perfectly to her taste. I'm not a big person on liking the appearance of homes and whatnot, but I admit the house didn't seem that bad. The home was a very old house that had been updated slightly. White two-story colonial with blue shutters and roofing. It even had a small balcony that connected to my parents' room. My sister and I were in separate rooms on either side of our parents'. The inside of the home was very bright. That's the best I can say. When my mother got a hold of the place, she did her best to light up the home. The stairs were in the very centre of the home and led up to a hallway leading to four rooms, three bedrooms and the upstairs bathroom. There were also stairs that led to a cellar, a room that we had avoided for a while for an unseen reason. There wasn't anything off-putting or strange about the place when we first moved there. I mean sure, there were noises such as creaking and other various sounds but it was to be expected with a house of its age. It seemed like the perfect home for a family our size and was very comfortable. Life in Georgia wasn't that much different than it had been in North Carolina. I went to school with my sister while my parents both worked at their jobs. It all went by smoothly for the first month. About exactly a month after we'd moved in, the noises began to get louder and accompanied by other strange occurrences. Windows and doors seemed to open and close by themselves, along with objects being rearranged. My parents didn't believe me or my sister when we experienced these things after school. They just dismissed it as us finally acting out about moving. This didn't make sense as I loved it here. I was finally making friends and my sister's popularity had sparked here too. Life was going good for us. There was just something going on in this house. Things only got worse. The noises became more frequent and soon things such as vases and glasses broke. One night I was awake in my bed deep into a show that I was watching on TV. I began to hear bits and pieces of a conversation. The voices sounded as if they were right out the window. This would place them on the balcony outside my parents' room. My room was made out to where I could turn around and look outside the window from my bed. I reached out and moved the blinds to allow just enough room to see the balcony. Don't. No. Don't go. Don't go to the cellar. That was the last I heard as the conversation ended. There was no sign of anyone out there in the darkness and it was all quiet. This caused me to rush out of my room into my parents'. I explained the whole event to them. They only would say that I was either tired or had fallen asleep. That was no dream and I most definitely was not tired. To say the least, I didn't get much sleep that night. Things were mostly quiet and seemingly normal for a while after that. I actually started getting sleep and felt like I was living in a normal house for once. There wasn't any strange occurrences happening when I got home or anything like that. For the first time, 
I invited four of my friends to stay the night one week. My friends arrived home that Friday, as things were still quiet in the home. We messed around most of the day, with things like games and watching TV. That night, we spent most of it telling ghost stories. My friends told pretty frightening tales, but when it got to me, I didn't know what to say. Not wanting to disappoint them, I began to explain what had been going on previously in the home. The four were fascinated, yet obviously terrified of what could be in that house with us. Being boys, they started with dares of me going to the cellar. Nobody had been down there at all. In fact, no one could as the door that led to it was stuck. My father had given up on trying to get it open and we all just went on without it. This turned out to be a good thing. Even though we knew the door was stuck, we went to try anyway. Every one of us tried to open the door, but to no avail, it wouldn't budge. At least the door didn't when it was just one of us messing with it. Together, we all acted as a battering ram and slammed into the door. Our combined force caused the door to slam open. A dreadful smell slammed against us as soon as the door hit the wall. A dark abyss welcomed us with the smell. I reached in and ran my hand against the wall, looking for a light switch, only to find one that didn't work. My friends remained at the door as I went to get a flashlight. When I returned, we all exchanged who we thought should go in. After a minute of the suggestions, I gave the idea of us all going in. As a group, we all decided this to be the best option, and this is what we did. Stepping out into the darkness to find the stairs that led down into the cellar. The smell only got worse as we went further in. It was an unknown smell to us all. It almost smelled like a mixture of the spray of a skunk and a rotten egg, but much much worse. We looked around as I shined the flashlight out into the room. The source of the stench was the most horrifying thing that we'd ever laid eyes on. In the room, there were human remains. The cellar seemed to be a room for where the previous occupant prepared his food. The remains were all mutilated and instruments of the evil act laid everywhere drenched with blood. The body hung from a chain. Part of its form missing in their place were broken bones. We were frozen in the room. We couldn't move due to the surprise, though shortly we did. As I turned the flashlight to another part of the room, we found another person to be there. He stood tall and turned to us. Pieces of his skin were missing. His face was partially missing, and some of his fingers were gone. His eyes focused on us as he opened his mouth to speak. Leave. His voice, a growl that sent shivers down our spines, and caused the adrenaline to kick into overdrive. We did as he said, and ran out of the room, the door slamming behind us. To finish the tale off, we didn't ever return to the cellar. No one has in years. The tale behind what had happened in that place was never explained to us. My family moved from that home far from it, and I hear that no one has ever lived in the home since. I'll never forget what we found in that cellar. I have one daughter. One of the biggest regrets I'll ever have in life is that I wasn't there for the birth of my daughter. 
I was on active deployment for the majority of my wife being pregnant and had to get updates at best, over email or sat phone. The day I came home for good, my wife was waiting with our daughter in the airport. It was the first time I had seen her in person and I didn't know if I should cry or smile or what. It was too much to figure out in the moment, so I just stared at her and let her take me in. She had this tiny little face, and I was so worried that she was going to cry. But she looked back at her mom for just a moment before reaching out her little hand, hooking it to the side of my mouth and tugging down with a little smile. I fell in love for just the second time in my life. For two years, things went on like I assume any other family life went. We had ups and downs, money troubles, and the sorts of things that parents deal with, I guess. Before my eyes, my daughter grew up and turned into this little person. She started to slowly waddle around the room before wobbling and falling back onto her butt. The sort of six-inch drop that startles them and even scares you as new parents the first time. But you know that you can't look scared, or they will cry. She was turning into a little girl, not just a baby. A toddler, I guess. Things, for all of life's problems, were good. The first time it happened, I didn't really pay much attention to it. I was getting ready for work in the morning. My wife was moving back and forth between the bathroom and the closet, getting ready for her job. Our daughter was sitting on the floor, quickly learning how to use my phone better than I can. My wife walked through the living room, putting in an earring and said, Okay girls, let's get ready to go. There was a tick, then a moment of realisation on her face as she smiled. Oh girl, not sure why I said that. I smiled too. We were both tired. Our daughter was going through a bad sleeping spell, where she would wake up in the middle of the night and demand to be in bed with my wife. Since I can be a little bit of a wild sleeper, thanks for that Uncle Sam, I would go out on the couch when I brought her into our bed. So no one was really getting the best night's sleep, let alone that we hadn't had sex in, well, I'd even lost track at that point. I'd even gotten a vasectomy since we agreed on just one child. So, no sleep, no fooling around. We were bound to say weird things. A couple of days later, I was out mowing the lawn when my wife came home from Target with a few bags of what looked like clothes. I hated seeing that. We didn't have that much money, and one of my wife's true vices was buying little girl clothes and treating our daughter like her personal doll. Admittedly, the cooing noise my wife made when she saw something like a tiny pair of overalls was cute. But come on. I finished up with the lawn and went inside to see my wife removing tags and getting the clothes ready for the wash. She held up a cute little pink dress she had bought with the usual, I'm sorry I couldn't help it, it's so cute. I just sort of nodded and grabbed a glass of water from the fridge, and I noticed that there was another dress on the table, just like it. What's that? I asked. My wife didn't react. She just kept removing tags. Hey, I said. Did you get two of the same dress? My wife looked back at me with a blank sort of stare and I pointed at the dress on the table. That one. Slowly, she looked back at the table. Oh, I guess I accidentally grabbed two. Sorry, I'll return it tomorrow. You took the tags off already. That's okay, she said. If nothing else, we can get store credit. It didn't make me happy to know that she probably wouldn't get the money back for the dress and that feeling was enough to divert my attention until dinner the next night. My daughter has about four things she will ever eat, but we were happy about that much. I know I was a picky eater, 
so any variation we could get in her, especially anything involving fruit or vegetables, was a win. My wife thought so too, and for just a moment, I thought she was preemptively hoping that her daughter would have a good appetite that night, as I saw her preparing two of the exact same meal on the little plastic plates we give her. Before I could say anything, she looked towards our daughter's room and said, Girls, it's time for dinner. What? I asked. What? She said back. She said back to me without looking up from setting the plates on the table at different seats. One at my daughter's high chair, and the other at a seat neither of us really sat in during meals. What's the second plate for? This time, when my wife looked back at me, there was something else there. It wasn't that absent-minded look that would come from being tired, or those parenting moments when you are just on autopilot. She didn't say anything to me. She just looked at me as her daughter struggled her way up into her chair and plopped down to eat. Then, she walked over to the fridge and put the plate in there before sitting down and helping our daughter to eat. I didn't say anything else to her. I didn't know what to say. I know she had experienced some postpartum stuff after our daughter was born, and there had been a lot going on at her work, so I didn't want to feel like I was pushing her or judging her or anything. But, I mean, it was messed up. As you can imagine, by the fact that I'm telling this at all, it got worse. Suddenly, everything that was happening with our daughter happened in twos. Two outfits, two dolls, two meals, everything. It didn't take more than a couple of days before I got really scared. I couldn't even talk to her about it. If I even brought it up, she would either leave the room will give me the most hateful look I've ever seen from her. I started with the internet. Mistake. Never look to the internet if you're just looking for a simple, calming answer. I got everything on there, from postpartum to schizophrenia. It was enough that I was getting scared for my daughter, so I got in touch with a gynecologist. I sat in her office and started to lay out what was going on. I got the usual doctor-patient confidentiality thing that I was expecting, but I had to press her. She was a doctor for Christ's sake. Do no harm and all that. Her silence was harming my wife if she knew anything. She thinks she has two daughters, Doc. I felt near tears. I wasn't sleeping much at all. None of it made any sense. So I couldn't turn off my mind and concentrate on anything. Maybe it would be best if she set up an appointment with me, said the doctor. She won't do that. She gets mad at me if I even try to mention anything involving our daughter in the first place. How am I supposed to get her in here? I mean, come on. There was to be something. Anything. The doctor looked concerned, and even a little nervous for a moment. She could be suffering from postpartum depression. It would make sense. Wait. What? What would make sense? The doctor's look went from nervous to confused. I... I just meant that, given the difficulties of pregnancy, that it would exacerbate things. What difficulties? She... She never told you? My tears quickly changed to rage. Just tell me what the hell is going on. Just tell me what the hell is going on. You need to calm down, she paused. There were a couple of incidents that I recall during the pregnancy, particularly when she came in for the ultrasound. When I showed her the image of your daughter, she became convinced that she saw two fetuses. It's a common side effect of the fertility drugs. What fertility drugs? You weren't taking fertility drugs. The pregnancy was, I mean, it wasn't something we were trying to do. The wall of silence seemed to melt away for at least a moment. One of you was. 
I think she started to realize that something serious was going on. I think she got scared for my wife's well-being. Maybe she was worried about her own job. It doesn't matter. She told me the details. After the ultrasound, as part of regular checkups, we would use an ultrasound to find and check the heartbeat. Again, your wife was convinced that there were two heartbeats. It wasn't anything serious. Most people aren't used to hearing the sound and it can be a little confusing. But she kept asking if I was sure there weren't two heartbeats. There weren't. The doctor stopped talking, but I knew there was more. This is my wife's life. This is my daughter's life. Tell me what happened. I think the threat of a lawsuit was enough fear to hear the rest. After your daughter was born, your wife started to push again. Even once the afterbirth had come out, she kept pushing. She didn't say anything, but I'm convinced that she thought there was another child inside of her. We held her two additional nights for observation, had her speak with unstaffed therapists, and she was given a clean bill of health. Pregnancy and birth can be incredibly taxing, both physically and mentally. So she could be going back to whatever she was going on when she was pregnant? It's possible. Has she been under additional stress lately? The doctor asked. Work has been rough, I guess. The doctor nodded. That could be it. I still think it would be a good idea for her to schedule an appointment to come in. Maybe she just needs to talk things through. Or maybe we need to look into medications to help her through. As much as I hated the idea of my wife having to take drugs to get better, I went through the same thing after I came home from the sandbox. Thanks again, Uncle Sam. And I hate it. I wanted her to get better. And it wasn't easy. I basically had to trick her into it saying that she should go in to get a checkup and flu shot and all that, so the girls would be safe. Yes, I said girls. It was the only way I even got her to respond to my concerns. I drove her to the appointment and sat in the waiting room for over an hour until the doctor came out with her. It was clear that my wife had been crying. But when I went up to her, she hugged me, and she felt different. The doctor had a look on her face too. Something had happened. The gist of it was that the doctor wrote her a prescription just in case, but recommended that we look into some family therapy. The trauma of me being gone for the pregnancy, along with the side effects of the fertility drugs, had paid a toll. Not to mention the fact that we still needed to talk about why the hell she had taken the drugs and not told me about them. Still, I got to take my wife home. She didn't mention the girls once. A daughter was at my mom's house for the day while we went to the appointment, so my wife would have time to go home and lie down for a rest. Rest, and eventually we could go through the healing processes. I stayed busy cleaning up the basement for a while, until I heard shuffling upstairs. It was getting late and I knew I should go pick up our daughter, so I went upstairs to make sure my wife was okay and ask if she needed me to pick up anything for dinner. What I saw was the end of my world. My wife lay on the floor of our kitchen, covered in blood, a knife in her hand. She had slashed at her own stomach with a carving knife. She made no sound as I saw her push her hand into her own gut, squishing through the blood and muscle and tissue. For all I had seen in battle, nothing could have prepared me to see anything like that. Slowly, as I fell over myself, slipping on the blood and trying to get to her, grabbing for a towel to cover the wound, she said one thing before dying. The doctor was right. You only have one daughter. I need to get the other one out.
Before, I said, one of my biggest regrets was missing my daughter's birth. And that's true. If I'd been there, maybe I could have seen this coming. Maybe I could have done something about it. My biggest regret was having an autopsy performed. I don't know why I did it. Maybe I thought she had been on drugs or something and needed closure as to how this could happen. I've seen blood and I've seen death, but nothing that would ever compare to what I saw on my own kitchen floor. It was one of those test results that I will always regret. The information was that an anomaly was found in my wife's uterus. An undeveloped fetus. I can't remember the term they used, but that's how they explained it. Yeah, there was a child in my wife's uterus, though for how long it was impossible to say. They thought it would have been years. All they could tell me was that DNA testing showed that it was my child, vasectomy or not, and that it was a girl. It was dark, dreary. The rain clouds had moved on, but water still dripped from the rooftops and skyscrapers, and they fell and fell and fell. Hypnotizing. Dangerous in a city where it's already so easy to be caught off guard. The hooded man approached me in the middle of the night, as I was walking home from a business meeting that ran late. He said the words that tear at the soul. A question with infinite answers, but always a constant result. I will grant you one wish. I laughed to myself. Crazy person or not, I knew how these stories always went. Make a wish, granted in a horrifying way, wisher dies. Simple as that. I read the monkey's paw. I'd seen Wishmaster. I wouldn't be so carelessly stupid. I thought myself clever when I made my wish, so innocuous that any play on it would be downright foolish. I wish for one dollar. Had it been a crazy person, even he could have granted this wish, but it was no crazy person. I watched as the hooded man raised his hands, cupping them around the air and slowly pulled a single dollar into reality, as though out of a black hole. It gingerly floated down into my cupped hands, and looked at the bill, incredulous, and when I looked up, the man was gone. At home, I could do nothing but stare at the bill, unsure if I had truly seen what I thought I had. How could he have done it? Was he really a genie of some sort? Was the bill even real? Or am I just dreaming? I was sure I wasn't. But these weren't the questions that bothered me the most. The thought that racked my brain endlessly was, did I just waste a legitimate supernatural wish on a single dollar? I'd figured if the man was the kind of genie I'd been brought up by horror stories to believe in, that he would have created some sort of hell for me in this wish. I figured the dollar would create minimal suffering at best, but I hadn't honestly expected the wish to come true anyway. I thought I was just humoring a crazy man. But nothing has happened. The supernatural being granted me my wish and went off. I could have had anything. Anything. I could have wished for billions instead of a single dollar. I could have wished for power, to be superhuman. I could have wished for world peace. But I had a dollar. One dollar. I didn't sleep that night. Hell, I didn't sleep for the next week. How could I? 
every missed opportunity, embarrassing moment in my past, anything I wanted to change just zipped through my mind. Every little annoyance echoed endlessly in my head. The woman in the cubicle next to me who kept smacking her gum. I could wish the mouth shut. The guy who kept bringing his work problems to me because he couldn't do them but still got paid more. I could have wished him to be fired. My boss, who did absolutely nothing but crap on me day in and day out. I could have wished him dead and had myself put in his place. Saturday, I went into work. The only person who works Saturdays is my boss. That dumb little ass. He never really worked. He went in to bang his secretary in empty offices while his wife at home with her two kids believed he was at work making them a better life. She would have thanked me. The staple on my desk would do the trick. I caught the secretary coming out of my boss's office. The back end of the stapler gashed right into a temple. She was out cold. My boss, still buttoning up his pants, tried the old trick of yelling at me and telling me I was fired to get me to stop advancing. But I could see the fear in his eyes. He couldn't even work his zipper right. I pushed him onto the desk, grabbed the fountain pen from his desk, and stabbed him in both of his eyes. This time, not so quick as a bash to the head. As he writhed on the desk, I took my rightful seat at his desk. This is what my wish could have been, I thought. This was the happiest I'd been all week. It could have been the happiest I'd ever been, as far as I could remember. Someone must have heard the screaming on one of the lower floors. We were at the top of 16 stories. Maybe it was someone else's boss screwing a secretary too who heard us. Someone who didn't have the guts to murder for a better job. Whoever it was, I knew they had heard us because I could hear the faint sound of sirens outside the building on the streets below. They probably wouldn't let me keep this job after what I'd done. I went up to the roof of the building, dragging the still twitching body of my former boss. When I got to the top, I found out I was right. Cop cars littered the street. Those are what I aimed for when I tossed the body head first off the building. I hit one car dead on. A cop car was always where I thought that guy belonged anyway. I heard the SWAT team bust the door open leading up to the roof. I pulled the dollar bill out of my pocket. My one wish. My one clever damn wish. I tore it in half and jumped before the SWAT team could grab me. Spending life in a cell would only create more problems I couldn't wish away. As I fell toward the pavement below, I looked down. In the midst of the police, no one seemed to notice the hooded man with glowing red eyes standing directly below me, arms wide as though he were about to catch me. My last thought before I showered the ground with my guts, my only clear thought in the entire past week was that the devil was far more clever than I. After cashing the checks, money orders and such, I returned to the office to get down to business. I've made quite a profit selling gas masks and protective gear. Business is good. After putting part of the money in the safe and in the cash box, I look over the stacks of orders. There are two orders in what I call the exempt pile. One order included an explanatory message saying that the customer thought it might be prudent to get a mask because there had been a couple of disasters near where she lived. I can sympathize. 
The other is from a guy saying he didn't care about any special features. He just wanted a cool mask to wear to an upcoming party. That's fine by me. It even strikes me as a little amusing for some reason. I take care of those orders first, carefully packaging the masks and making sure to set them apart from the others. After that's done, I tally the number of orders in the other stack, what I call the special orders pile. Once I'm sure of how many masks I'll need to prepare, I fetch the required number and bring them into the back room to begin the process. Safety is the primary thing. First, I inspect my gloves and apron, and finding no flaws, I put them on. Then, I don my best gas mask and make sure it's working as it should. With everything in order, I take one of the masks from its container, grab one of the jars from the shelf, and get to work. I pride myself on the thoroughness with which I work. By the time I'm done working on a mask, it's like the poison is bonded to the rubber, plastic, filters, etc. at the molecular level. Most customers wear the mask at least once. After all, the first thing most people do when they get a mask is try it on to make sure it fits properly. When they do, they inhale the poison with every breath, and every inch of skin in contact with the rest of the mask absorbs poison through the sweat glands. Even if the customer doesn't wear the mask, he or she just keeps it in storage in the house, the poison is very strong, and I take the liberty of poking tiny, nearly imperceptible holes in the bags I place the masks in before wrapping and packaging them. Poisonous fumes escape the bag and seep into the house, so chances are good the customer will still be poisoned to some extent. If the customer has ordered a complete hazmat suit, I hedge my bets by contaminating that too. Once the customers have sufficient amounts of the poison in their systems, they begin to succumb to paranoia and death. Some suffer cardiac arrest and or respiratory failure. Others are driven to commit murder-suicide due to paranoia. It's easy for me to find the obituaries, police blotters and news articles so it's simple to find the fates of the majority of my customers. There was a report from a nearby town of a man who went insane and shot his family members to death before taking a fatal dose of pills and booze. There was also an incident in another city of a woman who was shot to death by police after she took a gun and wandered through the streets raving and making violent threats. A case of unintentional suicide by cop. I checked my customer list against the police blotters and news reports. Sure enough, they were both on a special orders pile list. Sometimes I can tell beforehand that the poison is doing its work. For instance, there was a customer who, a couple of weeks after receiving his mask, requested five more masks, making all sorts of claims about why he needed them. I can tell from the bizarre claims he made that he was deep into the paranoia stage. I told him not to worry, that I would send him the new shipment of masks expedited delivery at no extra cost, since he was such a good customer. And please, let me know when the shipment arrived. Two days after, he contacted me to let me know it had arrived. I read his obituary. They speculated that it was stress that had caused this fatal heart attack. Funny stuff. The more people die, the more fear is generated. The more fearful and paranoid people come, the greater my sales. After the guy who ordered five additional masks had his heart attack, several of his friends and relatives ordered masks from me. This thing had them shaken, they said, and they would feel safer with something which could provide them with a little extra security, because you never know what might happen in life. I told them I understand completely, and that I would give them the exact same service I gave him. After the news reports of the woman who was shot by police, and of the man who killed his family, I searched and found the advertising offices for the newspapers in those cities. I placed an ad in each one, 
and after that, my sales in those cities took off like a rocket. Many of the customers I gained from those three incidents have already died, and more are on their way. The cycle continues as the process constantly replicates itself. Yep, business is good. Finally, it was time. You had worked hard and long at this. Days, months, years at a stupid, mindless job. Your body on automatic, or your mind raced ahead of itself. You had painstakingly built up a horde of sick days until you had a full month ready to go. That was it. This was your moment to shine. Your agent had weaseled you a contract for a real novel. No more short stories for you. You were finally going to write the novel you had always dreamed of. Action, adventure, comedy, romance, all with a neat twist no one had ever thought of. You laid your fingers upon the keyboard, ready to let loose. And there was a knock on your door. You cursed. You knew you would put up a no solicitor sign. You hadn't ordered any packages, and you had blasted all your social media to make sure your friends knew to leave you alone. You decided to ignore it. Fingers poised upon the keys again, you let your mind wander. You had the perfect beginning, start in medium res, a gripping scene of high fantasy, leading into a flashback during a drag... Again, there was a knock on your door. Heavier, more insistent. You glared at the door, as if, by force of will, you could make them go away. No thank you, you call out, loud enough to be heard through the cheap wood of the door. Once your fingers seek the home row keys, no hunt and peg typing for you. No, you are a master of your craft. The words will flow from your fingers like a fountain. No. A river. No, a veritable flood of... Knock, knock, knock. Loud enough, it felt like your house shook. Loud enough, it jarred your mind free from your fantasy world. You were out of your chair before you were thinking, crossing the living room in three great strides and throwing open the door. What? You yell, before you even look at the person before you. He's a small man, wider than he is tall. The word rotund springs to mind, like a human version of a rubber ball. His face damn near gleams, chubby cheeks nearly spherical as he looks up at you with nothing but wonder in his wide, innocent eyes. It's... it's you? He whispers. It's really you? You step back, startled at the tone of sheer devotion in his words. And his clothing. Well, it's vintage, but it's too vintage. He looks like he stepped out of a 90s advertisement. His clothes crisp and new, unworn since the day it was packaged. I'm sorry? You stutter out. Do I know you? No, of course not. How could you know me? I wasn't born when you... Well, no, you don't know me. But I know you. The whole world knows you. The greatest author to have ever lived. The one whose novels changed the very way the world thinks. He gushes, hands to his chest. You're the best. I, uh, think you have me confused with someone else. I haven't written any novels. Your hand is in the door, ready to close it. You haven't, yet. And the way he says it makes you turn and look at him again. The way he seems too real. 
His skin, no trace of flush. His blue eyes, bluer than any you've seen. His hair, perfectly coiffed, with no hint of product in it. I'm from... the future? You finish, faintly. What kind of science fiction writer would you be if you couldn't recognise a time traveller? You step back, feeling a little faint, and your visitor takes this as an invitation to step in, a suitcase and wheels following after him. No, not wheels. You peer down and see that it has dozens of tiny feet. You sit down heavily in shock and raise an eyebrow at the stranger. He glances back at his luggage and his face splits in a joyful grin. An homage. He doesn't really need the feet, but I couldn't resist. I mean, I know you've barely begun, but, well, you must have so many questions. Not really, you say. I mean, yes, they are boiling up inside me, eager to know. But I've read enough time traveller stories to know I shouldn't ask them. Well, maybe one. Why are you here? To the crux. Ah yes, to the crux, as ever. So salient and to the point. He fairly cackles with glee, rubbing chubby hands together. I am here for something very important. He kicks his suitcase gently. Nothing happens. He kicks it again, slightly harder this time, and the lid pops open, revealing a good thirty hardcover novels. They are beautiful books, your name blazing across the top of each one, but not blatantly. A subtle nod to you, worked into the very art of the jacket art. And the art? The covers blend into each other, revealing a completely different picture that takes as a whole than when individual. You grasp in delight, reaching out for them, only to be stopped by your visitor. I, well, can't let you read them. My chance too much. Our computers say that this won't much alter anything. What I need from you is simple. His face lights up with glee, his eyes sparkling. I need your autograph and the inside pages, please. Of, of course, anything for a fan. He already has a pen ready as you lean forward and begins to open the covers for you. Thank you, thank you, so much. This is so great of you. Can you make them out to Tim? Oh, thank you, thank you, yes. This one's my favourite. The twist at the end. Everyone spent years wondering how you were going to get the protagonist out of this, and then you did, and it was so masterful. I'm so glad I can meet you, on today of all days, when you begin your first masterpiece. He keeps up a steady stream of chatter as you sign each book. Your eyes slightly glazed, not trying to take in too many details. Words on the inside of the dust jacket stand out here and there. Jimothy, Coulter's, Death of the World of Spire, The Darkness That Dwells, and more. Just little hints of what is to come. You desperately try not to read them. You don't want to influence yourself. There you go. Signing the last one with a flourish. The front cover of this book is graced with what seems like an homage to the sci-fi novels of the 60s, but with a beautiful man barely dressed on the front cover instead of a woman. You smile up at him, a little strained. Is that... is that all? Oh yes, that will be perfect. He smiles at you again, bobbing his spheroid head. Thank you for this. I'll leave you in peace now. And he turns on his heel, his little footed luggage trailing along behind him as he goes. The door closes behind him. But you don't see whether he did it or the luggage did. You stay seated for several minutes. That was amazing. Phenomenal. Beyond belief. You slowly stand, snagging a soda from the fridge before you lazily make your way back to your computer. You are going to be an amazing writer. You swig at your soda. A world-changing writer, according to the traveller. Another swig, and you set the can down on your desk. 
Your computer hasn't even had time to go to sleep. And that artwork. You'd never seen a writer who'd connected his covers like that. The spines, sure, but the box themselves? The cursor blinks at you, almost accusatorily. You ignore it. You know you're going to be great. You saw your name spread across the entire series. So why can't you think of a single thing to write? It began like most of the nights at the Lorette nursing home. The sound of my footsteps filled the stark, empty hallway as I did my rounds. I heard the other orderlies refer to this place as the Vegetable Patch, and their characterization wasn't too far off. What may not be public knowledge is that coma patients oftentimes get sent to long-term care facilities such as this, regardless of age if they do not have any life-threatening medical conditions, or hope of waking for that matter. I glided past the rooms with my goal in sight. As I neared his suite, my feet picked up their pace. I entered Bill Waters' room and found his wife yet again at his side. I admired this woman greatly for her devotion to Bill. After nine long years, she was still his doting wife. Seeing her almost daily really touched my heart. This man must have been something special. Recently, I'd built a rapport with this woman and looked forward to seeing her kind face more than I cared to admit. This made what I planned for Bill much more difficult to keep a secret. You know, visiting hours are over, Mrs. Waters, I said with a warm smile. She paused before responding. He's in there, you know. I'm sure he is, I replied. No, I mean it. I can sense his presence. When you've been with someone as long as we've been together, you just know. I wouldn't come down here if... A tear streamed down her face. I was mesmerized by how she hadn't let go, that he was still very much part of her. I found myself gravitating towards him more so than the other sleepers. In fact, I developed a kind of obsession with him. His wife's affection for her comatose husband was contagious. I had already decided that I was going to try something unorthodox with Bill. As a matter of fact, it was to begin the following day from my conversation with Martha that evening. Anxiety filled me with restless dreams at night and remained with me the following day. You see, I had big plans for Bill. I had been under the same suspicion as his wife for quite some time. Even though he had been declared a vegetable by my colleagues, there was just something about his magnanimous face that screamed otherwise. On a lark, I had already hooked him up to an fMRI and had seen some startling results. His brain activity was alive and manic. Though I was incredulous at first, it also seemed to indicate that he was capable of responding to my voice and answering simple questions on a strictly neurological level. I had played this close to my chest and had not revealed this to anyone for two reasons. First, I guess you would call this a noble one. I wanted to be 100% certain that he was, in fact, still cognizant before filling his long, suffering wife with any false hope. Second, I guess the narcissistic reason, as a neuroscientist at heart, I had stumbled across something potentially earth-shattering. I really wanted to impress the medical community and the public at large with what I was planning. Our facility had an fMRI machine, which I had nearly unfettered access to at night. So, with Bill placed in the tube, I told him to think about a warm summer breeze. I checked the scans and told him to think about it again. The results 
were astonishingly similar. I spoke clearly and articulately that this means yes. That if he wants to answer yes to a question, he had to think of that breeze. Do you understand? A flurry of brain activity followed, not indicating the results I was looking for. Listen, Bill, I really need you to focus. Think of a warm breeze. This means yes. Do you understand? The thought pattern appeared once more. A smile cracked across my face. Now, I want you to think about a bucket of ice water. I want you to imagine plunging your hand inside. I want you to really feel the cold, Bill. The screen showed something wholly dissimilar to the previous command. Think about it again. Same results. This is no. I had him practice yes and no for a while. He caught on with astonishing speed. When I was satisfied with his ability to respond, I finally asked, Is your name Bill Waters? The results indicated yes. An even larger smile beamed from my face. Do you have a wife? Yes. Do you have children? No. I was very concerned that I was going to receive another yes result when I saw the neurological pattern emerge. My elation and admiration for this man grew tenfold. Then I asked the question I had been dreading. Are you in pain? Yes. My heart sank. The activity that I was seeing indicated this. I couldn't even begin to comprehend the existential anguish he was experiencing, let alone the excruciating physical pain. A little piece of me died right there in that room. This only strengthened my determination to help this man in any way I could. Do you know where you are? Yes. You are in a care facility in Rishosha, Wisconsin, is that correct? No. I tried again, simplifying the question. Are you in a care facility? No. Confusion set in. I surmised that I was admiring his progress so much that I had failed to realize the strain I was putting on him. I backed off for that day and kept my findings to myself. He was in no danger of going anywhere, and there were many more tests to run before I could make this stunning revelation public. In my bed that evening, I came up with an ambitious course of action. This was going to take a lot of time and effort, but I was confident I could get results. The next day, I revealed my plan to Bill. With my knowledge of neurological signatures, I came up with 26 distinct thought patterns that would be easy to distinguish in fMRI results. The letter A is jumping into a pile of sand, B is rubbing your fingers on a Brillo pad, etc. Each one would represent a letter of the alphabet. This is going to be a long and painstaking process that is going to require a lot of patience. Do you want to continue? Yes. So, with time and care, we began to work on learning the alphabet. Progress was more rapid than I ever could have imagined. Bill was an excellent student. I will never, ever forget when we had nailed down the letter I. I believe it was thinking about your barefoot entering a leather shoe. His brain lit up like a live wire. This is what he was telling me over and over again. Hi, 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 hi. My heart exploded with jubilation. I never could imagine that someone simply communicating hi would fill me with such raw emotion. Strangely, in that moment, I felt closer to Bill than I had ever felt to another human being. Tears welled up in my eyes. Well, 
Hi, Bill. The next day, I placed him in the tube again. This was the first thing he said to me. Hi, 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 hell, hi. His excitement was palpable. I was touched yet again. However, we were so close to completing the alphabet. I firmly stated that we needed to focus. I told him to concentrate on the task at hand. We continued our work that week and made significant progress. I went to bed that Monday with a smile on my face and an unparalleled feeling of contentment and accomplishment. This would all come crashing down the following day. So Bill, let's talk. Hi, hi, oh God, hell, hi, hi. Hi Bill, now concentrate for a second. What is your name? I waited patiently as Bill's brain went to work. Bill, oh God, hell. Great job, Bill. What's your wife's name? Martha, hi, 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 help. Excellent. Where are you now? In hell. My heart skipped a beat. I double-checked the results. That's what it translated to. No, you're in a long-term care facility. You're in a coma. Do you understand? No. Hell. The image I picked for L was driving on a Sunday afternoon through the country. To think that such a placid image could be imparting such an unsettling message sent shivers up and down my spine. I left the broom briefly to calm my nerves and also to give Bill a break. As I returned, I could see Bill was still talking. Say me so hot. Hi, hi, help. Bill, pl please calm down, I stammered. You're in a hospital. You're fine. I'm here. It'll be okay. No, hell, forever, in hell. For the first time in a while, I was feeling helpless. Bill's brain activity was crushing my heart. With all of the hard work and time we had spent together, I was beyond attached to him. My emotions ran high. It was unprofessional and spur of the moment, but I blurted out the first thing that came to my mind. Bill, just wake up! The emotion in that cry startled me. I had simply become too invested at this point. While these thoughts were rushing through my head, Bill's brain began to react again. I looked at the results. No, won't be me. What? I asked, almost at my wit's end. Will be Och, demon named Och. Fear seized me. At this point, I began to question my abilities to interpret these readings. However, after double checking everything, the message was loud and clear, so to speak. It'll be all right, Bill. I'm here. It'll be all right. I assured him repeatedly. No, hell eternal. This stirred to my core. I went home that night and attempted to sleep, but slumber refused to find me. After hanging up the phone, I hightailed it to the nursing home. I didn't care about the hour. I had to see with my own two eyes right then and there. Bill was awake and talking. A medical miracle. I entered the room and saw Martha cradling her husband. The unparalleled joy I was expecting in my heart was tempered by Bill's icy stare. As I introduced myself, his eyes trained on me. They exuded none of the warmth I had envisioned they would. They were cold and calculating. He frowned at me and didn't accept my hand. Fair enough, he was still recovering, and I didn't take his current state as a personal slight at the time. I looked at Martha as she continued to grasp her husband. A smile on her face refused to leave, even as Bill was clearly recoiling from her touch. The next day, 
I revealed what I had done. I made my results, save for the last session, public. I was lauded as a hero and received the accolades I was expecting. However, it all felt empty. Bill wanted no part of this and remained aloof and indifferent towards me. At first, I was worried that he thought I had exploited him. This didn't seem to be the case. As soon as I heard about his miraculous recovery, I couldn't wait to start a friendship with him. However, the guy just wanted nothing to do with me. With a now indelible frown hanging on his face, he rebuffed any opportunities for future research. He even refused to meet up for coffee, which hurt immensely. This all culminated with a conversation I had with Bill's wife three weeks ago. She entered my office looking weak and haggard. She had aged what seemed like a decade in the intervening weeks since I had last saw her. Before I could pose it a greeting, she said, It isn't him. Pardon, Martha? He isn't my husband. My husband was a kind and gentle man, always the warmest smile on his face. But this guy, this thing. She trailed off as she began to weep. I embraced her while having to choke back my own tears in the process. Listen, Martha, he's been through a lot. Many patients that recover from a comatose state experience personality shifts and abnormalities in behavior. Just have patience. He'll be the build you have always loved. Just give it time. I said this with conviction, but didn't believe a word of it. Something really was amiss. There was no denying it. Just give it time, Martha, I said once more. Unfortunately, time was something Martha didn't have. As I enter the visiting area of the jail, I pick up the phone. Staring back at me from the other side of the glass is a face that had once filled me with such hope. Now, I can barely look upon this homicidal monster without feeling physically ill. Jesus, what he did to Martha, the way they found her. A scowl hangs below his glaring and wanton eyes. They are trained on me with a ferocious intensity. He picks up the phone. Silence. Arch, I say with trepidation. My rational mind barely allows that word to escape my lips. A hint of light gleams in his eyes. His frown turns upwards to a nauseating smirk. This transforms his face into a visage of pure, unadulterated evil. I have to fight to not avert my gaze. With a wink, he finally speaks to me. Greetings, Dr. Williams. Bill says hi. Darling, hey darling, you got a little something in your shirt. Carl snapped out of his reverie long enough to shrug his shoulders and smile up at the waitress before diving back into the best damn sloppy joe he'd ever tasted. It seems he had lost all sense of proper dining etiquette after his first bite, but it didn't faze her for a second. She'd seen that glassy-eyed gaze many times before. She tossed a few more napkins on the table and shoveled away to top off a customer's coffee. A little while later, Carl dipped a napkin in his water and dabbed the greasy red splotches on his shirt. He did it more for the sake of appearance than anything else. The shirt was easily written off in his mind as a worthwhile sacrifice for discovering the best damn meal he'd ever had. Oh darling, I don't think that's coming out said the waitress with a motherly tone. He glanced at a name tag. Can I get one more to go, Nancy? 
Nancy smiled. Sure thing, sugar. The three hour drive home was almost unbearable. He kept glancing at the greasy paper bag in the passenger seat. Carl couldn't possibly eat another bite, but all he really wanted to do was pull over and eat that sloppy joe. He wiped the escaping saliva off the side of his mouth and revved his car up to 15 miles per hour over the limit. Carl didn't even think about unpacking his car. He just grabbed the doggy bag and rushed into his house. Moments later, the paper bag lay in shreds beneath the dining table. He carefully peeled back the foil wrapper, revealing the monster of a sandwich within. The cold, congealed mess before him seemed to taste even better than the fresh one he had earlier. Its soggy six-inch bun didn't dissuade him one bit. He devoured it quickly and wished he had another. The long drive between him and the only thing he cared to eat anymore was beginning to weigh on him. He'd make the trip straight from work on Fridays and sit down in his booth to two delicious sloppy joes. Thirty joes would make the long drive home with him, but eventually that wasn't enough to last him until the weekend. He was putting on so much weight, his girlfriend was always lecturing him about his eating habits. Carl, you've outgrown your clothes four times in three months. That's not healthy. Carl hated to admit it, but he knew something had to change. His new place was less than a mile from the diner, and his job at the only gas station in town gave him plenty of chances to weep between transactions. He felt bad about how he left things between him and his girlfriend, but the remorse didn't last long. They even displayed a framed picture of him in his booth at the diner where he visited at least three times a day. Seven months since that first life-changing Joe, and now he could finish off four of them at a time. Two for breakfast, three or four for lunch, four for dinner, and of course the occasional one as a snack. Carl didn't really think of much anymore other than the next sloppy Joe, and he couldn't have been happier. The world seemed so much easier to traverse now. Everything just fell into place once he sloughed off the trappings of his old life and focused what was really important to him. Hey Nancy, what can I do for you, hon? Well, I've been wondering. You guys are out in the middle of nowhere, but you stay so busy. How do you do it? Nothing to it, sugar. It's all because of our loyal customers. Years and years of regulars like yourself. Just look around at all the pictures on the walls. Oh, that reminds me. I'm sorry to tell you this, but due to the rise in food costs, we have to start charging you two more dollars per Joe. You okay with that, darling? This most recent cost hike didn't seem to even register in Carl's mind. He just absentmindedly said, Uh-huh. As he looked around at the photos of heavily obese people, all the way to the ceiling in some places. He looked at his picture hanging on the wall in his booth. It showed him sitting there with two sloppy joes on the table, his double chin accenting the wide smile on his face. He glanced down at his table and realized it was pushed as far as it could go to the other side of the booth to allow him to slide in and out. There wasn't enough room for even a child to sit on the other side and his gut already pressed against the edge of the table. Carl took the picture off the wall, pushed past Nancy, and headed towards the bathroom. He stood before the mirror and compared himself to the photo. The guy in the photo was much bigger than he used to be before all the sloppy joes, but his image in the mirror looked like someone who had eaten both of those guys. Carl pinched the rolls of fat under his chin and jiggled them. He thought about how he used to view fat people as lazy, insecure, and even stupid. It seemed strange to him that since he started putting on weight, he never once saw himself that way. His gurgling stomach reminded him of the four Joes being prepared for him right in the kitchen. He suddenly felt sickeningly hungry. He came out of the bathroom and started to scrutinize the photos in the hallway. Nancy stepped up to him. 
I wouldn't count him if I was you, hun. Your order will be up soon. Why don't you go sit down? I topped off your sweet tea. She began to walk away as Carl spoke up. All the people in these photos are dead now, aren't they? Nancy sighed and turned to face Carl. Most of them. But don't you think about that, sweetheart. All our regulars are the happiest they've ever been right to the end. The ding, ding, ding of the order bell yanked Carl from his depressing epiphany. I bet that's your Joe's right now, darling. She gave his fat shoulders a reassuring squeeze and headed over to the order window. He stood there at the hall entrance and looked out into the diner. The place was crowded as usual, with familiar faces he'd watched over the months bulk up like himself. Foot-long chili dogs, fried chicken with pasta, double bacon cheeseburgers, chicken and waffles, sloppy joes, and all sorts of other huge portions of archery, clogging foods were being devoured by the perfectly content customers. He wondered how many of them would succumb to heart failure within the year. Carl slid into his booth, sipped his sweet tea, and thought about the overwhelming contentedness he'd felt since he'd moved into the little pass-through town. He hung his picture back on the wall as the thought of the photo it had replaced came to mind. He vaguely remembered Nancy telling him her name was Ginger and she loved her chicken waffles. He recalled how happy she looked with a bottle of maple syrup in one hand and a fork in the other. Nancy showed up with two trays and expertly transferred his four joes to the table. Let me just grab you some extra napkins. Carl looked down at the four huge sloppy joes before him and uttered, Happy. Right to the end, huh? Nancy beamed a wide, toothy grin at him over her shoulder. That's right, sugar. Carl patted the sides of his belly and expertly grabbed a joe with both hands. Well, then tell the cook to get one more ready for me. I want to try for five today. It wasn't my dream to go to college, but it's where I ended up. To be honest, I'm two years in and I still don't know what I want to do. I hoped college would clear that up, but in some ways, it just made me more confused. Because of this, I've not been doing well. I don't pay attention, I forget to do the work, and sometimes I simply just don't show up. However, this doesn't mean I've not been busy. I play games, a lot. Gaming is more popular than it's ever been, and it's pretty much the only thing I've stuck to throughout my life. To most, this is a burnout thing to do. We all know the cliche of the loser who plays games all night and sleeps all day. But from what I've seen, there are many avenues to get a job in this field. A lot of it involves education or years of coding knowledge, both of which I don't have. But there are other ways to make a living and it was one of these paths which has led me to where I am today. I decided to take up streaming. It's simple. You play games live, people watch, and if they like you, they donate. It's a simple process. However, as I found out quickly, not an easy one. There are hundreds, if not thousands of streamers. I find it very hard to get a foothold as people were more interested in watching the more established streamers with their expensive face cam cameras and high-end setups. No one wanted to watch a college student play retro games on an emulator, cautious to not be too loud due to hard-studying neighbours. I needed a niche, and I found one. I was browsing the popular streams, seeing what people were interested to watch, and to see if I could hop on the bandwagon when I saw an immensely popular stream. 
It was a 24-hour live stream where, over the course of a week, people would speedrun games for charity. I was fascinated and lost a lot of sleep in awe of what they were doing. You'd think running a game would just be playing it fast, but there's so much more to it. Often, they would use glitches to do amazing things to skip major chunks of the game. Sometimes, a game would be run so efficiently that what would be a 10-hour game would be finished in a matter of minutes. Often, the more popular titles were retro games too, games I almost exclusively played. I set to it, and soon I was on the forums, chatting with other runners, finding posts written by runners on all the tricks of the games I loved, and soon I was streaming myself, slowly learning the process. It was great. Though I wasn't the best, not by a long shot, people still tuned in to watch me learn. It's such a cathartic thing to watch, and this built the platform for me to grow. I soon got so obsessed that it started to bleed over to my real life. I was on the phone with my mom, getting an earful about my awful performance at college, but all I could imagine was wishing there was a skip dialogue option in real life. I started fine-tuning my daily rituals to make better efficiency of my time. I even started imagining gaming interfaces in real life. Eating an apple? Plus two to hunger. Eating time, one minute. Coffee? Plus five energy. Drink time, five minutes. In hindsight, it was getting unhealthy. It was a culmination of sleepless nights, unhealthy obsession with speedrunning, and imagining things in the real world that made me do what I did. As usual, I was running late to college. It was raining. However, I never had an umbrella, so the rain kept getting in my eyes. Soon, I was running to the front of the building, occasionally glimpsing the open door up the steps through rain-attacked eyes. As I scrambled up the steps, my foot slipped. My foot didn't catch the step right, and soon it was under me. However, when I opened my eyes, I was fine, and my foot was on the step. I looked at my shin, which I felt should have been scraped up, and there wasn't a mark. I should have just counted my blessings and moved on. However, I distinctly felt my leg shoot down. I lifted my foot and inspected the step. It was hard to see with the rain cascading down, but something was off. So, I spent the next few minutes looking it over. From what I concluded, the edge of the step wasn't fully connected. The cornering had the smallest gap, very hard to make out, especially in the heavy weather conditions. But between that microscopic gap, something was off. It moved differently than the rest of the floor when I moved my head. I started stamping on it over and over, seeing what would happen. And again, after some time, I felt my foot fall through. My body jolted like I'd just woken from a fallen dream, and my heart skipped a bit. However, when I opened my eyes, my foot was on the step, and my leg was fine. Still in my speedrunning mindset, I thought to myself, Am I clipping through this step? And if so, can I go all the way through? If there's a common mindset in the speedrunning community, is that you have to try everything. Everything. I hobbled back up the path and took a flying run up. Soon, I was running full pelt and jumped feet first into the step. What I felt was unnatural. It was akin to jumping into a deep pool of water at an incredible speed. I was under the ground, everything around me a dark void. I looked up and watched my body fumble violently into the building. Suddenly, my breathing stopped. My air exited my body and my eyes closed. When I opened them, I was back in my body, in the building, very winded. 
I slowly got back up and shook off the pain. I was now inside, but something felt off. There was an air of stillness to the hallway, where I was overwhelmed by the sound of rain was now an eerie silence. Behind me, the door was closed, something which I never did. I pulled the door open, only for my eyes and ears to be assaulted by a strange scene. Though I could not see rain, I could hear a heavy, constant sound, much akin to white noise on full volume. After I winced from that, I then took in the sight. The geographical layout was the same, but so many things just seemed off. Colours felt more dry and flat. What was once a red brick wall on the campus opposite the building I was in was now a smooth, blurry texture. The grassy field was now a green, untextured mess, and there were no signs of people, despite the campus being sparsely populated only moments ago. Despite the protests of my ears, I wanted to see more. I stepped forward to exit the building, but my face hit hard against something and my vision was blocked. After rubbing my nose, wincing in pain, I looked up to see the door now closed. Confused, I pulled it open again to be assaulted by the sound once more. I stepped forward more cautiously this time. However, I met the same fate and bounced back, looking at the now shut door. Panic started to set in. A claustrophobic feeling was welling inside me from the idea of being trapped. I took a few deep breaths and decided to explore the building instead. The inside wasn't much better than the outside. What was once an intrinsically tarred floor was now what I can only describe as a mess of polygons. Posters advertising various college activities were now blank, paper-coloured rectangles. The doors looked painted onto the wall, and when I pulled on the sticking-out lump of what was supposed to be a doorknob, they didn't budge. The panic from before came back in full force, and I curled up into a ball hyperventilating until I passed out. When I came to, there was a brief moment of reprise, a glimmer of hope that it was all a dream, and I simply fell asleep in class from sleep deprivation. But when my eyes struggled to focus on the wall in front of me after waking, and never truly focusing, I realised I was staring at the untextured mess of the world I was now in. After a few deep breaths, I got to looking around again, looking for something I may have missed. I searched over and over for what felt like hours, each time coming to the same conclusion. I was stuck. It got worse when I started thinking in game terms. In speedrunning a game, if your game crashed, you hard locked your game. If your game was in a state where you could still move, but you were stuck in an area with no way out, you soft locked your game. Once this happened, you had to either reset your game or die. And I fervently tried denying the fact that I may have soft locked my life. But then an epiphany hit me. I got into this mess by thinking like a gamer. And I wasn't thinking like a gamer to get out. Often, when you break a game to clip around the map, you often leave the game in a state where you can do it again. I just needed to find that way out. I did what quality assurance testers do to find bugs in games. I jumped into anything and everything. It took hours, and it hurt the whole time. I jumped into wall after wall, I shoulder barged each door I could find. I made my way around the ground floor. When that didn't work, I made my way up and up until I was on the second floor. I was beginning to give up hope until I tackled into the pinboard for club posters. 
My arm slipped through a point where the corner of the crooked poster met another. This was my out. I took a few steps back and ran into it as hard as I could. When I opened my eyes, I was falling from quite a height. I met the floor with a hard thump, which took the wind out of me. When I doubled over, I saw where I was. I was back outside. Things were a bit clearer now. No longer was the grass just a green mush, and the rain could be seen again. However, it wasn't complete. Like, I still wasn't loaded in properly. Upon closer inspection, the grass was still the garbled mess, but now with a few patches of grass rendered in. I could see the windows and buildings, however, they weren't transparent, and if I focused enough, I could see the rain was almost like it was 2D sprites and passing through me. There were people here now, but not like I expected at all. It was hard to distinguish who was who. Everyone was more like a blank, rendered shape of a person, their voices hard to pick up. I tried grabbing someone, but passed right through them. I couldn't communicate with them either. I could touch anything that didn't move, just not people. Everything was surreal. There were sights I'd seen which I couldn't even comprehend. Some textures moved differently to how my head was moving, causing me to close my eyes in pain and avoid looking in that direction. I discovered something peculiar after a few hours of screaming at whoever I could find. I was following people and making constant noise, hoping something would go through. I followed one particular person for ages until they pulled out their phone. I faintly heard him talking to what I presume was his mother. I was screaming up and down about nonsense until he stopped, which made me stop. I listened intently until I heard something along the lines of, oh, it stopped. Okay, cool. Must have just been interference. Then watched them walk off. From this, I pieced together I can possibly communicate with technology in limited ways. This has caused me to find random computers and try to operate them. I say try because I can't see what's on screen and I can't see the letters on the keyboard, making me rely on touch typing. I've been like this for the better part of a year now, and I've been typing out variations of my circumstance anytime I can. Who knows how many times I've typed everything out on a login screen or onto a computer's desktop or something inane like that. But one of these has to work. One of these has to make it onto the right place and find the right person. Someone. Anyone who can help me. I can't starve. I can't die. I'm stuck like this. And I need help. For my whole life, I have had no sight whatsoever. I have to say it like that because the definition of legally blind is such a broad term that it sort of lost its meaning for my situation. People often use my situation as a talking point. Would you rather lose your sight or your hearing? If you lost your sight, what would you miss the most? These kinds of questions. Life isn't as dismal as it sounds in people's hypotheticals though. It's not too hard to have a normal and fulfilling life, and this is what I was going for. I had a stable job. I'd work 5-8 to eight hours every weekday doing manual fittings for various products. It was something I could do with just touch, and my co-workers there were more than catering to my needs. Not that I needed much. I am more than capable to do most things on my own. This was a shared view by my closest co-worker, Hugo. He worked in the same room as me, and did pretty much the same job. 
Now Hugo, he was a character. We'd talk all day, non-stop, about God knows what. It'd be a name chatter that isn't memorable enough to recall. It was always in the moment talk, but it'd get us both through the day. When I would finish work, I'd make my way home and be greeted by my roommate, Bob. He wasn't as charismatic as Hugo, but he was still great company. Due to him being wheelchair bound, he almost never left the house. In fact, in the time that I'd known him, I never witnessed him leave once. He didn't need to anyway. Bob worked from home on his computer, which was also where he socialized and spent his free time. I'd often sit with him and watch a movie that he boasted about downloading so close to the release date, and we'd have a great time. When I was at home, I'd often talk about work, and with that, Hugo. I'd tell of all the bizarre conversations at work, and Bob would barely laugh at each one. And when I was at work, I'd talk about what I did with Bob the night before, which Hugo loved. This was the cycle of my life, and this kept turning until something seemed slightly off. One day, Hugo was distant. He worked away next to me, but didn't have that Hugo vibe he always had. At first, I didn't pry, feeling it was probably something personal. Besides, people who set up that high-energy persona never usually like to open up, trying to keep that bulletproof appearance. When it persisted the next day, however, I felt it was my duty as a friend to ask him what was up. As expected, he dodged the question, first by denying it, then trying to recreate the magic we'd share. It was a flimsy and transparent attempt, which wasn't hard to see through, something which I called him out on. This killed the mood once more, however the ball was now in his court to break the silence. After a few moments of contemplation, I heard his tools drop, and he opened up. What he told me stunned me. Apparently, he came over to my house the other day to surprise me. The surprise was that he wanted to see if I was up for going out, and he wanted to meet the fabled Bob who I spoke so highly of for so long. There was no answer when he knocked, so he tried to look for me through the window. What he saw, however, was something he never expected. He saw me talking and watching a movie but no one else was there. I was apparently watching a movie by myself. Around me, he saw no evidence that anyone else was living with me. At first, I denied it, saying that couldn't be the case. I watched the movie with Bob. I knew I had. The simplest explanation was that he just didn't see Bob due to the angle he was looking in. He was taken aback at first, but then he contemplated it for a moment and seemed to accept it. Great, I thought. Things will return to normal. But they never did. When I got home, I called out to Bob. He greeted me as usual, and I tried settling into my routine. We talked about our day, myself choosing to omit the bizarre accusation from earlier, and sat down to watch a movie he'd found. I had all but readily denied what Hugo said, but to humour myself, I decided to test something. I did this by asking Bob to turn off the audio descriptive voiceover, something I obviously needed to experience movies. Bob was initially confused, but I just told him that this time I wanted him to enjoy the movie without the jarring commentary. At first, he insisted we have it on so that I could experience it, but I played the friend card and said it was a treat to him, and that I was a bit too distracted that evening to really pay attention, which, in a way, was true. It wasn't long until the movie was over. I'd heard all the dialogue, but I didn't have any idea what really happened. This is where I test my confirmations. I asked Bob questions about the movie. 
first, I asked about the setting, which he couldn't answer. Odd, but it could have been a trick question depending on the type of movie. I then asked what the main premise of the movie was. He paused, and again, he didn't know. I asked why he couldn't answer these questions, and his reply was that he sort of relied on the audio descriptive voiceover to explain things, that he was a bit slow sometimes, but he was too polite to say. I smiled, and we laughed about the whole thing. It seemed right. Bob was a bit slow at times, not catching references as easily without a bit of an on-the-nose prompt. Soon, I was lying in bed, just mulling over how silly the whole thing was. But annoyingly, it hit me again. That whole exchange didn't confirm a thing. In fact, it might have made things worse. At work the next day, Hugo and I hit things off with a bang. We were back to our old selves. A relieving semblance of routine was partly restored. We joked about many things and worked through the day. I tried sneaking in the topic as slyly as possible, simply asking what he would do if he thought his roommate wasn't real. He picked up on this right away and sensed something was wrong, and the air became palpable. I guess there isn't an easy way to bring up such an off-topic conversation like that. He sat there, audibly thinking, his hums indicating various ideas running through his head. I waited until I was jolted by the sudden aha that he exclaimed. He told me that the best way to find out is to try to imagine Bob away. At first, I cocked my head at the notion, but the more I thought about it, the more it made sense. I thanked him for the idea, and before long, I was away. At home, Bob greeted me as usual. I waved, but in my head, I repeated, You're not real. Disappear. Go away. Over and over. Bob broke the long silence and asked if I was okay. I just autopiloted through the conversation. After each line, I'd go back to repeating my thoughts. This is when I felt like things were starting to work. After some silence, I relaxed. I had the feeling that I was alone. But before long, I'd hear the small squeak of the wheels on his chair, and he'd be back, asking more probing questions. His presence started to grate on me. I found myself snapping back at questions which were otherwise remedial. I remember storming off to the couch and just ignoring him until he went away. Each time, I'd reinforce in my head that he wasn't real. Eventually, I was left in silence. I didn't hear a peep out of him the rest of that night, and I was finally at peace. The day after, I talked to Hugo about it. He was as freaked out as I was at this possibility. We spent the day speculating, trying to explain away various behaviours that made me think Bob was real. It was easy explaining why no one had met him before and why he'd never leave the house. Then the conversation moved on to, maybe there was a squeak in the old house, which I imagined as a wheelchair, and what if the reason I imagined his presence was from the characters in the movies I was watching? Each idea we laughed at, but each one chipped away at a revelation that this might be true. When I got home, I wasn't greeted this time. I thought maybe the whole day talking things out at work had erased this need to not feel alone. I was almost ready to accept this, when the all too familiar squeak resounded, and soon I was greeted with Bob's presence. I just ignored him and went to make some food. Silence. I took this as progress, and I took my food to the table, ready to eat. With this, I heard Bob squeak over 
and tried to start conversation. I just blanked him and carried on like he wasn't there. After a few, you're blind, but I know you're not deaf, taunts, he defeatedly disappeared, and that was the last I heard from him that day. Each time this happened, I'd bring my progress to Hugo. He basically became a sort of counsellor for this whole ordeal. I mean, he was the one who pointed me in the right direction. It made sense that he'd be the best at helping me. This didn't keep up for long, however. One day, Bob snapped. He screamed bloody murder about how bad I was acting, about why he didn't understand why I was doing this. Really, he should have known. He was a manifestation of my own psyche, so really, he knew everything. This was all just an act, something to make me relapse to my old delusional ways. This was it, I thought. Maybe this was his last outburst before I could finally put an end to this. He screamed more, getting very close to me, but I kept my composure. All of a sudden, I felt a sharp shunt hit me, the feeling of Bob ramming me with his wheelchair. It almost fooled me, but I knew the coffee table was there, an easy way for my mind to trick me. I just rubbed my leg and sat down silently. After this, my imagination ran rampant. He was getting up in my face, screaming and hollering at the top of his lungs. I knew this was going to be the end. I mean, who wants to willingly be phased out of existence? I know I wouldn't, but I could no longer give it power. Bob was an illness. A part of me I no longer wanted to exist. The hitting started. I felt the pounds of arms wildly but weakly slapping me. Possibly me hitting myself. All a trick. All a lie. But this opened up a new avenue. If that thing thinks it can attack me, maybe I can attack it back. In sheer surprise, I swung my arms in return and forced the entity back. I blindly swung over and over, targeting where I heard the wailing. The being was now just a blubbering mess, no doubt trying to drum up sympathy. But I knew it had to end. I braced its imaginary neck and squeezed until there was nothing but silence. I soon let go and sighed in relief. For a while, I just sat there, contemplating all that happened. It was grim, but I felt it was for the best. I knew I had to find closure and be on with my life. I stood up and walked to the kitchen and was met with a thud. My leg caught on something. I felt around and the wheelchair was almost definitely real, possibly a tool for my manifestation. I tried to heave it out of the way, but... It was heavier than it should have been. I felt around, and my heart sank. On top was the still warm mass, which was my friend. Fervent denial ran over me as I escaped my house. I was confused. I was scared. I picked up my phone and called Hugo. No answer. It made sense. Hugo was still at work. I fumbled around with the assistive technology, and soon the phone was ringing my workplace. My voice was trembling, and my vernacular must have been a mess, but I managed to stumble my words out. I asked for Hugo, which the secretary confusedly asked for a last name. I told her, and she did a quick search, but found nothing. It figures the system at work was wildly outdated. I just demanded that she puts me through to the room I work in. There was a phone in there which I used all the time for requests. What she told me drove me mad. She told me that it was pointless, that there would be no one there, because I work alone. I sarcastically asked who I'd been talking to the whole time I'd worked there. 
She said that they just thought it was something I did, that I talked myself to cope with work. My anger turned to confusion, which turned to realization, which turned to shock. The last emotion I landed on as I thought about my dear friend was regret. The first thing I remember after waking up was hearing a loud gasp, followed by the inane chatters and sounds of the bustling room. My whole body was sore, and the constant beeping of the machines around me felt deafening. It wasn't hard to figure out I was in the hospital, and that it was serious. I was soon greeted by various doctors and nurses, each happy, and each doing their own tests. Piecing together the story from each of them, I was in some sort of motor accident, and I had been out for almost two weeks. I also seemed to have some form of amnesia, however my wife, who had visited every day, would be able to fill me in. Though the initial shock was quite heavy, I did feel a lot better knowing that I had someone as close as my wife to help me through this. My only concern was that I had no memory of ever having a wife. It wasn't long until I heard the happy squealing of a woman, followed by a very fast and heavy hug. I sensed passion, though I hesitantly reciprocated due to the fact that I couldn't shake the feeling that she seemed to be a complete stranger to me. At first, this disheartened her. However, she soon took on an optimistic demeanour and took it as a challenge we'd do together to fix. Though I didn't share her enthusiasm, I was happy in being given some direction in my otherwise confusion-filled world. I instinctively looked at my hand. No wedding ring. When I asked her about that, she said that I hated wearing rings. It did make sense. My finger joints are annoyingly big, which caused a great deal of bother to wear them. Soon, I was eating heartily, enjoying every bite, despite it being mediocre hospital food. Before I finished, however, my wife stopped me and said, Wait, don't finish that. I have an idea. I slowly stopped, savouring the bite I had in my mouth and the one I had in my fork, stopping there to technically be following her instructions. She rushed off with a cheerful skip and a step. I sat there, feeling a bit overwhelmed by the whole situation. It didn't take long for her to bound back in and start grabbing my things and quickly shoving them in her bag. Whoa, 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 slow down. What are you doing? I exclaimed, wide-eyed and confused. We're getting out of here. Doctors say you can't, but I asked if anything bad would happen and the nurse said you should be fine. She replied. I froze for a second, running over what I should do in my head, whether this was a good idea or bad. This seems a bit too fast. Shouldn't we wait until the doctors officially discharge me? I said, hesitantly. Since when did you care about that? Besides, I'll have you back later. I just want to do something with you real quick. She shot back. She acted like this would have been something I'd normally have done which made me feel I should see this through, in case something came back to me. I started helping her pack. I didn't know where we were going, but it seemed like she was excited. And she was my wife, so I tried to get excited too. I spotted a business card on the table with a private number of a nurse. I presumed she was my personal nurse, so I pocketed it. We soon rushed to her car and were on the roads. I stared out the window, taking in this seemingly familiar yet unknown world. She caught attention to my pondering and asked if I remembered anything. I shook my head in a solemn way. 
Her face dropped a bit in sadness, but then quickly bounced back to her usual jovial demeanor. Don't worry, everything will be fine. I soaked in her enthusiasm and chose to believe her. At this, I took note of her properly for the first time. She was very pretty. If she was my wife, I'd feel like the luckiest guy in the world. But this thought soon soured. If she was my wife. If. This one word of doubt shook my world and sent my mind spiraling. However, I couldn't quickly leap on that suspicion. For a start, if I was wrong, she'd be devastated. And if I was right, I was in a fast moving car and my luck with vehicles was apparently terrible as of late. I simply kept it in, mindful of the suspicion but not revealing my suspicion just yet. Soon we pulled into a car park to a large department store. Wait here, she said. Can't I come with you? I asked, wanting to keep her in sight. No, it'll ruin the surprise. I'll be right back. You'll live, she replied, sounding almost like she was calling back to an old joke, which was a good sign that we may indeed have history, but a joke I didn't get, which meant it could be part of an elaborate lie. With that, she grabbed her phone and was off. That took away one idea, to call someone to verify things. I sat there, straining my brain to try remember something, anything to alleviate my uneased mind. However, all that came from it was a headache. Imagine the worst case of writer's block, but about your whole life. Not a fun situation to be in. She was in the store a while, but she eventually came back with bags and bags of stuff. What they were, I didn't know. They were bagged multiple times, seemingly to hide the heaps of contents within. Hey, I said, lightly. Sorry for keeping you waiting, I had to get a lot of things. I have a feeling things are going to get messy, she said, cheekily. I laughed it off, notably hesitant. Her demeanor dropped. Is everything alright? Yeah, I just... I'm just adjusting, is all. I stammered. I didn't want to give away my suspicions. Not yet. With this, she seemed to accept it, almost too quickly, and carried on back to how she always was. We were soon back on the road, and my mind turned back to the bags. So... What's in the bags? I asked, as I turned my head to peek. Don't look! She exclaimed, which shocked me bolt upright, facing forward. But not before catching a glimpse of something metal and sharp. This image lingered in my mind, as I now had more questions than answers. I'm not your wife, she suddenly said, flatly, out of nowhere. What? I exclaimed, surprised. Is that what you're thinking? You look like you're thinking of something crazy, she said, with a smile on her face. Oh, no, I'm just, you know, adjusting, like I said. Okay, well, don't worry. Your surprise is to die for. Those last few words echoed through my mind while I tried to determine whether it was just an expression or a hint to something more sinister. My fears weren't alleviated when we took some back roads to a middle of nowhere abandoned looking factory. Where are we? I asked hesitantly. You don't, don't worry about it. Don't think about it. It'll all make sense soon, I promise. Wait here, she replied. With that, she grabbed all the bags and heaved them with her as she went in the building. My heart was racing. I didn't know what to do, what to think. My eyes darted around, and that's when I saw it. She left her phone. I grabbed it 
and immediately dialed in the number of my nurse from the card I took earlier. After a few rings, she picked up. Hello? She answered. Hi, uh, it's... Damn, I forgot my name. Oh, I'm guessing you're Andy. Car accident? Day out with a wife? She replied, making the last one sound mischievous. Yes, well, I'm actually calling about that. I'm a bit scared, I replied. Well, what's wrong? She replied, more seriously this time. How do you know she's my wife? Well, she... I was startled at the sound of someone outside the car, before I jumped at the sound of the door opening. What are you doing? She said, in a mildly condescending tone. Oh, nothing, I just... She looked at the phone, then I looked at the phone. You got a call and you weren't here to answer it. I thought it might be important. I handed her the phone, not really knowing what would happen. What happened next was a short, awkward exchange in which the nurse must have played along and said it was a wrong number. It wasn't long until she had me blindfolded, her guiding me slowly to the door. We've been hanging out here for as long as we can remember. It's been our go-to spot for special occasions, she narrated. This old place? Seems a bit... weird, I replied. Don't worry, once you're in, you'll never want to leave. I gulped and stepped in. She walked me through while holding one of my hands. I reached up my spare hand and pretended to scratch my face, but really lifted a bit of the blindfold. What I saw in the short time it lifted slightly was perturbing. Old, rusty chains with hooks hanging from the ceiling, rows and rows of old, rusty tables. It seemed to be an old butcher's place. Things did not seem right. On the other end, she didn't seem put off at all, taking in the surroundings like a familiar friend. The last thing I peeked before the cloth slid back down was a pristine metal table in the middle of the room with a brand new knife, presumably the one bought just earlier. That was the signal. The tipping point that made me realize she was not as she seemed. None of this made sense. No memory of a wife, no wedding ring, an abandoned butcher's shop, a freshly bought knife. She was going to end me here. And I let it happen. But I didn't have to. She didn't know I was suspicious of her. Or at least, she didn't know how strong my conviction of the suspicions were. I slowly lifted my blindfold again, but this time she took note of it. Hey, no peeking, you will ruin that. I quickly picked up the nearest object and swung it. She must have been expecting it because she ducked the first one, but she didn't dodge the second or the third. Soon she was on the floor, twitching. My heart sank. What had I done? I reeled back in shock. But now I was safe. My shoulders dropped and I let go of the old pipe that was now covered in a thin coat of red. Surprise! I heard from all around me. This outburst made me fall to the floor. I scrambled around, trying to gather myself. I quickly snatched up the pipe and clutched it to my chest, not knowing what to expect. I turned to face where the exclamations had come from, and my entire world shattered. My friends, all standing there, holding a cake. The faces that were looking at me all came back. The surroundings all made sense. Our old hangout spot. It's where I made my friends. It's where I had all my childhood adventures. It's where I met my wife. Their faces all shared the same emotion of shock and disgust. I was pulled out of my trip of nostalgia, and a blood-soaked hand gripped my leg. I looked across at what remained of my beautiful wife's face, as her life 
left arise. I recently moved to Laxalev for work. Even though it was January, I figured that since I was out in the wilderness, that I might as well go out into the woods to explore a bit. There wasn't a whole lot to do in town. Besides, I'd heard the trails in Isengleskigen were pretty nice. There were only a few blocks between my house and the edge of the woods anyway. I grabbed a bottle of water and a little bag of trail mix, I was going on a trail after all, and headed out. It had snowed the day before. I guess snow is pretty common up here. It was a pretty soft, powdery snow, the kind ski resorts prefer. It crunched loudly as I stepped on it. Despite the trail being covered up by the snow, I was pretty confident in my ability to keep track of the trail, since the forest was somewhat dense and the opening where the trees were removed was pretty distinguishable. I wasn't worried about that. It was still pretty early in the afternoon, only about 1pm. I wasn't worried about the sun going down. Then again, I had only moved from Virginia fairly recently, so northern Norway might as well have been on a different planet in terms of climate and daylight. At least, that's what I thought. It might have just been such a big change that I was seeing as being bigger than it was, but I digress. After about half an hour, I wasn't terribly deep into the woods. I was moving at a pretty leisurely pace after all. I had passed a lot of scenery, but nothing that really stood out. Just a lot of trees, a few of which had fallen. It was at this point that I realised something that surprised me just a little. I wasn't alone in the woods. I stopped briefly when I noticed that a few flakes were weakly drifting to the ground and noticed that I could hear something else. I could hear the sound of snow crunching under another human's feet. They didn't sound like they were wearing heavy boots or anything. It was just quieter than that. I could only really tell it was a person because it was clearly two feet. Crunch, crunch, crunch. They sounded distant just barely close enough for me to actually hear it. The woods were pretty quiet. It wasn't windy or anything like that. That's when I saw her in the distance. A woman. Although my memory is shaky, I'd place her in the ballpark of about 50 yards away. I could just barely see her moving between the trees, drifting almost casually through the snow. Something struck me about her appearance though. I had to get closer to her to know if I was right or not. So, I pursued her. I didn't want to call out to her yet. I began trying to hurry up. She didn't seem like she was moving very fast, but I was struggling to keep sight of her in the forest. Finally, I was about 10 yards away from her. I was now close enough to confirm what I thought I'd seen before. The woman was completely naked. I figured this woman must need help, that she must have been on something or mentally ill. Nobody walks around in the snowy woods with no clothes on. Excuse me, I piped up. She didn't acknowledge me. She must have been on some serious drugs. Excuse me, I repeated, a bit louder this time. She kept walking. Although, when I said that, her pace had slowed just a bit. I didn't mean to stare, considering the situation. But she really was gorgeous from what I saw of her. Without going into any lurid details, I'll just say that her body and what little of her face I managed to see was damn near perfect. I shook off the distraction and began trying to approach her. I got to about five yards from her and she suddenly stopped. It was such a sudden thing that I stopped too. Excuse me ma'am, 
Are you okay? I asked in the best Norwegian I could. Admittedly, not very good. She stood, motionless in the forest for a few seconds, before quickly turning to me. I got a good look at her face now. She didn't seem particularly bothered by the cold. Her flowing blonde hair looked to have just come from a salon. Her body didn't seem to be reacting to the cold at all. No frostbite, no bluish tint, no shivering, not even goosebumps. What really struck me about her was her eyes. Her eyes were an icy, cold-looking blue, almost grey. She had no particular expression, and despite having turned to me, she didn't seem to really notice that I was there. Her face and body language didn't indicate that she was actually acknowledging me. She never looked directly at me. I figured that she must really be on some serious drugs. I stopped for a second or two to think of what she might be on before remembering her current situation. Um, ma'am, are you alright? I repeated. No response. Look, I can call a hospital for you if you need me to, I offered. At that point, I realised that I didn't bring my cell phone with me. What would I do now? I had no way of contacting authorities with this drugged up naked lady in the middle of the frozen woods, but I didn't feel comfortable just leaving her out here to go and get help. What if a search team wouldn't be able to find her in time? How long had she been out here anyway? I figured that my best option would be trying to coax her to following me back to town. Ma'am, would you like my coat? I offered. It was probably better than just letting her freeze after all. She didn't react to my question at all. Despite the cold, I took off my coat and began to approach her. That's when I noticed something I didn't notice before. Her fingers and toes now seemed to be a blue colour. She didn't seem at all frostbitten not a moment ago. Where did that come from so fast? I knew I had to get her out of there, and fast. As I got closer, there was more frostbite I hadn't noticed before on her nose and ears. Suddenly, she turned away from me and began walking away. Hey, wait! I called out to her. No response. Suddenly, her pace quickened. A few seconds later, she was running. A few seconds after that, she was out of sight. Damn it! I shouted. I would have to try to follow her footprints in the snow. That's when I noticed that she wasn't leaving any footprints. What the hell was going on here? A naked lady walking aimlessly out in the woods in the middle of a Norwegian winter with randomly appearing frostbite and she wasn't leaving any footprints. Was she on drugs or was I? I thought about just turning back and trying to get back to town, but I still thought it'd be better to find her and lead her back. I would just grab her and carry or drag her if necessary. I wasn't going to let this lady freeze to death while I could do something about it, even if she was apparently levitating. It was at this point that I realised that I didn't know where I was. In my attempts to get to her, I had lost track of the trail. Well, now I felt stupid. My own footprints, I thought. I turned around and found that my footprints were also gone. My trail now just started where I was standing in the moment. Had the snow filled them in, or was I going crazy? I know for a goddamn fact that I wasn't levitating. It was at this revelation that I was becoming legitimately afraid. Something was seriously wrong here. What could I do now? I didn't know where the lady was anymore and I didn't know how to get back to town, even if I could find her. Isengleskigen is a big expanse of forest. It eventually extends back to a mountain range. Unfortunately, 
The trees were too thick to see the mountains for reference. Where the hell was I? I could see one thing, however. The sun was starting to go down. The sun goes down pretty early around here. I guess it was a mistake to go out this late. I figured I'd be home by now. I decided that all I could really do was start walking the direction I thought I came from. The direction that would lead me back home. I picked the direction that had been directly behind me when I lost sight of the woman. I figured that if I could find the trail, it would be easy. I felt terrible leaving her that way. But I needed to know where the hell I was before I could effectively help her. I was now considering just rushing home and calling the authorities to be the best available option. But first, I needed to find home. I walked for what felt like hours through snow and trees without ever finding the trail. I didn't know if this was more of my mind playing tricks on me, similar to my footprints disappearing, or if I had legitimately gone in the wrong direction. I paused to look around when I noticed the woman walking off in the distance. Relative to my position, she was at 3.30, about 20 yards away. I stared at her for a few seconds, realizing that she was actually looking at me. The fact that she was looking at me was creepier than when she wasn't. I was frozen in place, too confused to approach her. I knew I needed her help, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to anymore. All of this seemed so off. She then began taking a few slow steps towards me. I don't know why, but I was getting really scared now. I took a few steps back to attempt to match the ground she was gaining on me. She didn't seem determined to get to me. In fact, despite looking at me, she still didn't seem like she actually noticed me as much as she was looking in that direction and I happened to be in the way. I was, for some reason, apprehensive to turn away from her and just run. I was still clinging to the idea that this was just a normal woman, out of her mind on drugs, who needed my help. My own pace was beginning to slow. I don't know why. I wanted to get away from her for some reason, but my body just wasn't moving the way it should have been. I was cold. It was like ice was forming in my blood. She was gaining ground on me pretty quickly. Ma'am, if you need help, I can help you, I said. We can get back to town. Laxalev, you know where that is, right? It's just on the outside of the woods here. Do you want me to help you? No response. I looked down and saw that her hands and feet were frostbitten. There were also patches of frostbite all over her body now. Had her condition become more severe? When she got closer, the frostbite was on her lips, turning them a dull blue colour. Her breasts and face were slowly becoming flushed in a frosty blue. Ma'am, your frostbite is getting worse. We need to get you to town. Will you take my coat? I shouted. I was becoming panicked at her bizarre behaviour and the entire situation. There really was something severely wrong here. A large clump of snow fell from a branch above me and crashed to my head. It didn't hurt, but I had to wipe the snow from my eyes. It took a little effort getting it out. I looked up from my struggle to notice her, now standing very close to me, nearly arm's length away. That's when I lost it. I began to will myself away from her. I took off running, not caring what direction I was heading anymore, as long as I could get away from that monster, that thing. She wasn't human, or if she was, she wasn't a normal human. When I looked up at her that time, her body was completely covered in frostbite. The entirety of her skin was a deep blue colour. Patches of decay pocketed her skin. Her arms from her forearms down to her legs from the mid-calf down 
was skeletal. Her face was mutilated by frostbite, her ears and nose missing, the rims of her lips missing, her breasts were actually missing entirely, and a large patch of mutilation carved into her chest by frostbite, exposing just a small amount of her ribcage. I was just about out of my mind. I was running now. I had no idea where I would end up. I was just hoping to find the edge of the woods before she might have found me. I couldn't tell at all if I was getting closer to safety or further into the woods. Then I kind of wondered if just escaping the woods would be enough. Would she follow me out? I didn't know what to think anymore. That thing obviously wasn't human anymore, assuming it ever really was, so I don't know if it would conform to human logic. All I could do was cycle through begging not to be found, begging to escape somewhere safe, cursing my entire decision to go walking out into the woods, cursing the woods themselves, asking what the hell she was, all of this. It was all I could do while running to avoid going crazy. I don't know, maybe it was making the whole thing worse. I ran for what must have been a few hours. It was dark now. As I was running, I tripped over a root, steered sideways, and slammed my back into a tree. It was now too dark for me to see anything, and I was now too tired to even move. If she were to find me, that's all there was to it. I would have to rest, build up some strength. I backed myself up against the tree I had collided with and stared into the blackness, hoping not to get attacked. I remembered the food I brought with me and pulled out my bottle of water. All the liquid had frozen solid. I found that odd because I didn't really think it was cold enough for that to happen especially since it had been in my coat pocket the entire time. Maybe I was just losing it. Well, I couldn't drink ice, so I moved onto the trail mix. It was fine and gave me a bit of strength. Stopping to eat, let me at least try to collect myself. I could really only wonder what the hell that thing was, why I was seeing so many weird things going on with the snow and ice. There had to be some kind of connection. But I wasn't about to approach any solid ideas as to what it was. As I sat in the dark, I could hear snow crunching somewhere. It was pitch black, but I could tell it was somewhere to my right. I was too exhausted to move now. All I could really do was sit against the tree and hope she didn't find me, or at least hope that whatever she would do to me wouldn't be too bad. For some reason, I doubted that. When I looked at her back then, she was looking at me for just a second. When I could see what she really was, that frostbitten corpse, her eyes stayed, but they were glazed over, like she was drugged or something. For just a second, she looked right at me with such a look of intent. I can't think of what she might want to do to me, but I'm not really liking any of the options. As I sat there, listening to the distant crunching, I focused so intently, I could feel every single snowflake that hit me. They seemed to be getting colder somehow. The entire forest seemed to be dropping in temperature. I honestly wasn't sure I would live to see her catch me. I might freeze to death first. I was trying to think that maybe I shouldn't just be sitting here, but I couldn't decide which was more dangerous. Walking around, hoping not to be found, or sitting in one spot, hoping not to be found. I wasn't so sure about my odds either way. I looked behind the tree to still see nothing in the dark. I was pretty quickly darting my eyes and head around, desperately trying to get a visual on something, anything. I couldn't even see the tree I was leaning against. It must have been a new moon or something. I was so paranoid. I was pretty quickly losing track of time. I had no idea what time it might be, but things were starting to get blurry. 
some point, I must have fallen asleep, because suddenly I opened my eyes to see broad daylight. In hindsight, I kind of wish I'd been able to stay awake. Although nothing happened, something easily could have. In fact, whatever she was seemed to have such a good grasp on the woods, I'm surprised she didn't find me. The only thing I can really think of is that she must have found me, but thought it would be too easy if I was sleeping when she did it. I looked to my right and saw footprints in the snow. Not a trail, just two footprints side by side, like somebody hovered over me, landing right there, and flew away. Was she watching me the entire night? Damn, I think that might actually be worse than if she caught me, because now I know she's toying with me. I'm not sure if she considered me more prey or a toy, but I didn't like either option. Now that it was morning and I had rested, I decided I needed to start running again, trying to find the trail, the edge of the woods, anything. Honestly, I was sore as hell from all that running, but I guess I couldn't avoid more of it. I started out at a slow walk, keeping my eye out for whatever that thing might be. This was a bit difficult, since I wanted desperately to just take off and run. I had to think about where I was going instead of just zipping around blindly. I thought of looking for moss on trees, since I knew the woods were to the southeast of town. Conveniently, the trees had no moss at all. Neither did the nearby rocks. I tried to think back on where the sun set last night. I wasn't awake to see it rise, and I was running so blindly I didn't notice where it set. The sun was currently to my left. I didn't know what time it was or what direction that was, so that was worthless. I wish I was an expert tracker. I'm sure some hunter or navigator would be able to get me out of the woods. So now, I just had to walk, hoping I wouldn't run into that thing again. I walked for a while, what had to be two hours or so. I still didn't seem to be anywhere near the edge of the woods. I still couldn't see anything notable. It was mostly just a flat plain of snow with trees all over it. I kind of wish they had put a sign up at the edge of the woods warning people not to go into it. Then again, I'm sure a warning naked zombie lady sign would be dismissed as a joke. At this point, I realized I was stupid and just ate a handful of snow. I completely forgot that snow was just fluffy water and just went without liquid because my water bottle was frozen. I must have been so confused with exhaustion that I didn't even think of it. With that refresher, I began to realize I was being followed again. I could hear the snow crunching from behind me again. I turned to face it, but there was nothing there. I gazed around, but still couldn't see anything. I needed to hurry up before that thing caught up to me, so I got up and kept moving. It was hours later, and I still didn't see any scenery that looked even remotely unique. I had no idea these woods were this big. I realized that nobody really knew me, so nobody would probably be looking for me. I wasn't really counting on that anyway, honestly. I just needed to find a way out. At this rate, I wasn't sure if I was just walking in circles or not. At this point, I realized the sun was hanging low in a certain direction. That must have been west. I knew I needed to go northwest, so all I had to do was head in some direction from there. I didn't know where I would come out, but it was worth a shot. So I started walking. I walked for several more hours in what I assumed was a straight line. It didn't seem to be taking me anywhere, but I knew that it had to have been. I looked up, trying to focus on the sun, trying to see which way I was going. Around then, I turned back to my path to see that imitation of a woman 
standing directly in front of me. She was far enough away that I couldn't see if there was any frostbite on her this time. She didn't look like it, but she was staring directly at me and walking toward me. I had an advantage this time, or at least I thought. I knew where the hell I was going. I turned left and started running towards the sun. I knew there was a highway that went through a part of the woods. I wasn't so intent on getting to the highway as my definite destination, just as insurance. If she blocks my path directly to town, I can find some semblance of civilization. I ran for a few minutes before realizing that I'd lost her, or at least it looked like I did. I wasn't sure anymore. She could be anywhere, I was starting to realize. I slowed to a stop and surveyed my surroundings. I didn't see her anywhere, nor any sign of her. A small sliver of sun was peeking through the trees now, but I could tell it would probably be setting within the hour. I had to find my way out before that happened, otherwise I would lose my only usable reference point. I took off running again, sprinting through the forest, dodging between trees in the somewhat rare occasion that it was necessary. I had no idea how long I was running, maybe 45 minutes, but it was rapidly getting darker, and I was losing light and my ability to navigate. I could only try to keep running in a single direction, and just keep going in that direction once the sun was down. I felt I had a pretty good system going now. Surely I couldn't get lost if I kept in a straight line. The only thing I really had to worry about was getting interrupted. At that point, I crashed into a tree. I had been running for hours. I must have been tired again. I was numb all over most of my body now, from both cold and exhaustion. My coat wasn't really protecting me from the environment the way it should have been. As I slowly rose to my feet, I saw an opening in the trees. It was the trail. I had finally found it again. I climbed back to two feet and staggered onto it. I felt a lot better knowing I had found a sign that I was on the right track. I then realized I had something of a conundrum. Should I really follow the trail? Or should I keep going in a straight line the way I was? I remembered seeing the map of the trail outside, seeing that it wasn't just one trail, but a huge network. I don't remember any specific directions or paths or routes, but I knew that just blindly following the trail might not necessarily be a good idea, especially now that I was already on a good path. I decided the trail could go screw itself and kept walking the straight line. It was so dark now, I could barely see. I couldn't quite move as quickly as I was before, but I wasn't about to just stop. I didn't trust my safety to that monster. It was now practically pitch black. I didn't know what time it must have been. I had been alternating between walking and running for more than 24 hours now. When the hell would these woods end? These woods couldn't have been this expansive. They just couldn't have been. I must have been just completely lost at this point. I didn't know what to think at that point, and I still don't, to be honest. While I was lost in thought, I realized the sun went down. The night wasn't quite as dark as the night before, but it was still nearly pitch black. I wouldn't just be running blindly anymore, so I kept walking straight. I felt in front of me for trees, groping blindly like an idiot. I must have looked like one to that sadistic wench. I went on grabbing at nothing for several hours. It had to be past midnight when I suddenly felt something that wasn't natural. I felt a quick brush of a wispy, spiderweb-like form. It was hair. Her hair. That thing's hair. I stepped back for a second, looking around in the darkness. I couldn't see her anywhere. I could just barely make out the trees around me, silhouetted black against extremely dark grey. 
I stood, mostly blind, probably helpless against this monster in the dark. Not seeing her was worse than seeing her. That paranoia that grips you as a little kid in your bedroom, staring at the closet, waiting for the boogeyman to come out and eat you. I finally took a step, not feeling any sign of her anywhere. I kept taking a few very small steps, trying to make some kind of headway. At this rate, I wasn't sure I would even notice if I was out of the woods or not. I could just be standing in a field, and I might not really notice. I debunked that when I felt a tree's bark in front of me. I began maneuvering around it, keeping at its base to avoid losing my direction. As I rounded the trunk, I felt something. I felt two icy cold skeletal hands lightly caress the sides of my neck. I felt what must have been that thing's shredded lips lightly kiss my ear. At that moment, I lost it. I turned around, took a swing, hitting nothing, and turned back, taking off running. Kind of funny how quickly I abandoned my plan of just staying low. I have no idea what the hell that thing wanted, but it wouldn't be getting it from me. I sprinted through the woods, occasionally bumping into the edge of a tree, heading where I prayed was northwest. I was in a full panic, just barely keeping it together enough to remember where I was supposed to be going. It was a flashback to the night before, where I just ran blindly and probably got myself as lost as I was. At least I could hope I had stayed in the right direction this time, but I wasn't banking on it. I had to avoid trees in the dark, hoping that lady wasn't behind me or in front of me. That might have been the thing that panicked me the most. The idea that I would just run right into her in the dark and never see her coming. I couldn't shake that feeling. I never felt like she wasn't right next to me. I knew she was always somewhere close by, watching me, waiting for whatever she wanted from me. At some point in the dark, I suddenly ran into something. It was low and hard. It seemed to be a big rock. I felt one of my shin bones shatter on contact from how hard I was running, combined with the shape of it. I went hurtling a river, rolled over the top of it, and landed in what seemed to be a collection of smaller rocks. I groped my way around before finding my footing. The rocks I was standing on were loose, so I ended up falling again. My hand landed just right for me to get an idea of the rock itself. It felt so strange. It actually didn't seem like stone. It was too light for that. I picked it up and felt its shape, discovering it to be a bone. I felt around a bit more and found that all of the small rocks I was laying on were bones. Some of them clearly human. I began trying to crawl my way out before brushing my hand on something metallic. I picked it up, finding it to be an old lighter. I gave it a few clicks to see if it worked. I have no idea if it did, since I was terrible with lighters. I could never really get one to light up. As I sat there, I felt something brush against my leg. It was a hand. I jumped back assuming it was her. As I backed away, I heard what I could only describe as a hoarse, weak wheezing noise. I grabbed a large rock, crawling over it in an attempt to rest for energy. I wasn't sure how well I could do with a busted leg bone. As I sat back, I could hear snow crunching from behind me. I listened carefully trying to see exactly where it was coming from. How close was it? It was in the bone pile, apparently. The footsteps suddenly stopped as I heard total silence for a few seconds. The wheezing kicked back, more panicked sounding this time, like a person who had their vocal cords cut, desperately trying to talk. I suddenly began hearing a different grunting noise, it sounded like bone breaking. 
It sounded like flesh tearing. I didn't know what was worse, what was happening, or what might be happening. Not knowing killed me. I had to know what it was. Curiosity was driving me mad, even though I dreaded what the answer to my question might be. Finally, I decided I had to see it. I peeked over the rock, seeing nothing but darkness, of course. I remembered the lighter, giving it a few flicks before finally getting the damn thing to light. When I looked down, I saw her. I now saw the full scope of the bone pile. It was huge. It looked almost like one of those mass graves that genocide and massacres have been known to produce. There were some animal bones too. Deer, birds, dogs. But it seemed like it was mostly people. As I looked closely, I saw tooth marks on the bones. As I looked up, I saw exactly what she was doing. The exact source of that noise. It was a man. He looked to be a middle-aged man, or at least what was left of him. His body was missing from around his stomach down. She was holding his torso up, devouring him. She was biting off huge mouthfuls of organs and flesh, breaking bone with her teeth. Where it had once wore its disguise as a normal woman, attempting to maintain a sort of dignity or beauty, its facade had mostly been abandoned. Its mouth opened too wide, probably due to what seemed to be her cheeks missing, and hungrily tore off chunks of flesh, ravenously, animalistically. She looked up at me, giving me a frigid look with those eyes. She glared at me, her female dignity facade returning. She stood, her mouth drenched in frozen blood. The man seemed to be fading quickly. His body was blue from frostbite. I have no idea how he was still alive, but he probably wouldn't be for much longer. As she approached me, she took further notice of the lighter I carried. She seemed to shy away from it when she saw it, like she was afraid of it. She approached me nonetheless, slowly inching closer. As she approached, I realized what it was. Everything about her was cold. Her body was cold. Her home was cold. Her victims were cold. Her food was cold. He must be something she can't deal with. As she was within arm's reach, I thrust a lighter at her. She quickly backed away, before continuing her approach. I tried this a few more times before realizing that I was right. She can't stand heat. At this point, I had a crazy idea that I must have gotten from an action movie. I figured that if she was afraid or weakened by heat, I could set her on fire and possibly be done with her for good. As well as I could, I kept the lighter lit up and gently tossed it at her, reaching right into her hair. Her hair was lightly singed, apparently catching a slight bit of fire before the lighter faded out on the ground. I couldn't see what was happening anymore, just embers coming from her apparently burning hair. I didn't want to stick around, this thing didn't seem very mortal, so I didn't want to risk the idea that I had only ticked it off. As best as I could with my busted up leg, I took off running. That wasn't very fast, more like a quickened limp, but it was fast enough. I didn't see any really convincing signs that she was following me, but I'll never be sure. Everything after that just kind of blurred together. I have no clue how long I might have been running. It seemed almost like I might have fallen asleep while running, because suddenly I was reaching the highway, staggering out onto the pavement and collapsing. At this point, I blacked out. What happened between then and when I woke up in the hospital was extremely fuzzy. I must have been picked up by somebody at some point, but I don't remember who they were or when they came along. 
and just came to for a few seconds in somebody's car, or it might have been the cab of a truck. The person asked me who I was. I answered, and they asked me what I was doing out in the woods and what had happened to me. For all I know, I blacked out again before I could answer. I woke up in the hospital in the afternoon. The doctors and police were asking me what happened to me. I didn't mention the bones, fearing doing so would be sending some police officers to their deaths. I just told them that I had gone for a walk in the woods and became hopelessly lost. One officer asked me about the marks of my body. Apparently, when the woman touched me, she left marks of frostbite on my neck in the shape of a skeletal hand. I told them that I had no idea how that came to be. They didn't really seem to press the issue. I got home a few days later. I started my job a few days after that. I wasn't really that great in Norwegian, but had a passing knowledge of it. I asked a few co-workers about Isengleskogen. One older guy told me about the woods being haunted by something, but he didn't really elaborate. I don't think I really needed him to, since I knew all I needed to know about it. On rare occasions, I felt like I was back in there. A sudden chilly draft in my house, and the feeling that I'm being watched, even in the summer, even after I moved to Ottawa, once again for work. The frostbite she left on my neck left a very visible scar. It still hurts a little bit, but especially in the winter, on cold, snowy days, it feels like knives. I don't recommend ever going into Isengleskogen. again, not even for a second. I don't know what that thing was, where she came from, or if she survived my attack. I was lucky to have gotten away, because I know that if I hadn't found that lighter, I probably would have ended up the same as that guy. I still warn you that if you decide to go into Isengleskogen, again, I can't promise that you'll do any better than I did. I had the best night of my life aboard Flight 217. Whether my ticket was incorrect or switched, my original destination was to the far east, China to be exact. I stood in the airport alone, watching the clock, awaiting the moment where the business trip to a foreign land would bore me to exhaustion. The Minneapolis terminal was rather empty, even for 1am. The intercom called for boarding of the flight. The fact I was the lone passenger felt awkward, but my trip was of too much importance to worry. The gate ticker showing Flight 217 to East stared me down as I passed, its red streaming letters flashing against my eyes. Its gaze showed no information on passengers, no time, no destination. I strutted through the boarding terminal which remained dim. Breaths began to stumble out of my chest. No flight attendant appeared to be standing at the end to greet passengers, and I had spotted no other human since I entered the terminal hours before. My steps slowed as I came to the door, paranoid to find the plane cabin just as deserted. The plane was packed. I breathed easy again. Finding an open seat took a few minutes. None of the passengers reacted to my passing. Some were occupied in conversation, but most were inactive, relaxed in their seats. As my eyes wandered the cabin, I noticed that there was a vast diversity between the static passengers. The majority of them were young, but they appeared to come from many cultures and ethnicities. Clothing ran the spectrum of bright to shaded, and faces lined the rows as though they were albums of portraits. I took the first seat I found open, 
which was near the centre of the plane. It was a centre seat between two women, who were both reclined in their chairs. Their eyes were closed, and they didn't appear disturbed as I stepped into the seat between them. The moment I was seated, the flight attendant approached me. Ticket, please, she said. Her voice held life, but lacked enthusiasm. Oh, of course, I replied, reaching into my pocket to retrieve the ticket. I handed it to her, and she made no reaction. Her blank face stared at me. I'm sorry, but we don't accept that form of ticket here. Real entry ticket, please. I'm not sure that I follow. Really? She said, with increased volume and widened eyes. Are you new to this flight, sir? Yes, actually, I said. Am I in the wrong place? I wasn't sure myself that the ticket was correct. What is a notable sin you've committed, sir? What? A significant sin. It's what we require of all passengers for entry. We require it in writing beforehand. But you appear to have misunderstood. So a verbal entry will suffice. I took a moment to glance the cabin again. It was now silent. The other passengers remained still in their seats. All heads were reclined. All eyes were closed. The flight attendant continued to stare at me, ignoring my glances at the crowd. I'm sorry, I said, beginning to stand. There must have been a mistake. This isn't where I belong. I'll be going, thank you. Very well, the attendant said. She turned away and walked to the front of the cabin. No heads turned as I moved back to the entrance door. My shadow had become lighter, in which I noticed that the lights had dimmed since my entrance. My thoughts became interrupted by the silence. I stood by the door, stopped to blink, and all the sensations I had felt walking up had seemed to vanish. Behind me, no passengers had moved an inch. To my right, the pilot's cabin door was closed. The flight attendant stared forward, down the walking lane. The boarding tunnel was now black. A small light from the terminal was visible from the end, but the space between appeared to have vanished. I attempted to move my foot forward, but it proved to be strangely difficult. I could move, my foot shook, my body rejecting the action. A fear claimed my head of what could lie ahead in the shrouded tunnel. A curiosity for the flight, however, grew stronger. I turned to the flight attendant. She didn't look to me until I spoke. My wife, I said. I had an affair with her about a year ago. It was when I was on a business trip to Shanghai. I still haven't told her. I don't know if she's found out at all. The flight attendant nodded, then looked forward again. A willingness to move returned to me, in which I made my way to the same seat as before. I buckled the seatbelt as the sounds of the engine began to build. The engines grew more intense, but they also sounded far more close, like the walls of the plane had disappeared. The high-pitched whistling and charge of the machines took over my train of thought. Despite the stress of the noise, I still found myself motionless. My hands were gripped to the armrests, my legs were both to the floor, and my head was placed against the headrest behind. The only difference between me and the rest of the passengers was the fact that my eyes were still open, darting across the cabin in distress. Three seconds passed. Then, I was the same, unconscious. I awoke to hear numerous voices, accompanied by laughter, shouts of occasional screams. I was convinced I was trapped in a dream, but I could still feel my body stretched in a seated position on the plane. The air felt warmer and humid, 
and a powerful odour of smoke and chemicals struck me as my senses returned. The volume of surrounding noises fluctuated. A constant aura of conversation could be heard, but was interrupted by the sounds of outrage, joy and violence. My eyes crept open to find the cabin bathed in a shroud of dim, red light. Most people were silhouettes, but they were active. Almost everyone was out of their seats, standing or walking about. When my eyes were adjusted to the low lighting, I turned to my left, which were the seats next to me. The center seat was empty, though a man by the window appeared to be in a straight daze. His head was slouched against the wall, and he kept his eyes towards the ceiling. His mouth hung open, while the rest of him remained relaxed. I could make out his facial expression a bit easier because of how close he was, and it gave off an unsettling vibe of lifelessness. I turned my head to the right. There was a darkened figure of a woman straddling a man in his seat. The man pulls out her hair, and the woman's moan can be heard over the surrounding voices and shouts. They clawed at each other in seconds, biting and ripping garments. I caught a brief glimpse of their crotches intertwining before I snapped my eyes away. I was awake, to say the least. Passengers walked, ran, and stumbled back and forth down the cabin. A woman tripped and fell across my lap. She grasped at the seats before turning her face to mine. She cast an intrigued smile, with both cheeks bruised to a deep black. I jumped at the sight, pushing her off me out of an instinct of fear. She giggled as she hit the floor of the walkway. I stood and surveyed the whole cabin. My eyes were adjusted, in which the circus around me became most vivid. It was immoral, corrupted chaos. Men and women scuffled among their seats, grasping bottles in one hand and delivering punches with the other. Others screwed in plain sight as though the crowd was invisible. The seats, windows and walkway were lined with alcohol, blood, vomit and fluids that made me question my own sense of smell. I turned and ran towards the front of the cabin. I could feel my throat growing sore from screaming, but my volume was overshadowed by curses screams and moans. On the way up, I bumped and pushed against oncoming, crazed humans. Most didn't seem to care as I shoved them aside. My ankles felt continuously grasped at by mangled, broken hands. As I approached the front of the cabin, a large, well-built man stood in front of me. He was naked, and his mouth bleeding. He stepped forward with a growl, revealing a mouth of broken, crooked teeth. In an instant of confusion, he delivered a strike to the side of my face. I darted downwards, struck a chair's armrest, then hit the floor. Though my vision became blurred, my eyes looked down at the cabin, witnessing the freak show. I was stepped on every few seconds by other passengers who had now become ravaged and disheveled. Skin had stripped from broken glass, hair was ripped straight from the scalps of struggling individuals, a man stumbling down the aisle collapsed in front of me, his mouth gaping open with eyes peered up. He mumbled senseless gibberish, before falling silent, with blood still spewing from his lips. His tongue had appeared missing. The sight sent me to my feet, still dizzy from the man's blow. The number of active passengers had decreased since I woke up. Most were lifeless on the floor, their clothing ripped away and bodies splintered with cuts and glass. I saw the naked man from before, lying in an aisle, before turning my head away. I witnessed his crotch to be covered in a glossy, dark red colour. I closed my eyes waiting to awake from a nightmare. I hoped, then begged, then prayed for the noises to cease. Instead, my body grew warmer. My gasping started to calm, but I began to tremble. My heart rate remained quick, 
but changed its rhythm. Breaths became slow and shaky. I opened my eyes again and the image hadn't changed. The vicious, animal nature of the remaining passengers still lived on. No one was left docile. Violent monsters stood to their feet in a free-for-all. What was the most chilling was that no one appeared frightened. Bodies were frantic, but faces gave off a vibe of joy and excitement. Everyone had their own form of corrupted, sinful smiles. In turn, I began to form mine. My pulse quickened, more so when I was terrified. A tingle surged throughout my spine and legs. Deep breaths passed out of my mouth. I rushed back towards the mass of bodies and found myself excited at the freedom before me. I stumbled at a body below. It was a man, his eyes gouged, still gripping a bottle of clear liquid. I grabbed it, dumped the rest of the drink down and pressed forward. The taste of vodka stung my throat, though it held a faint flavor of iron. A woman was in the aisle. She was young, blonde-haired, skin color unrecognizable in the red light. Her frail back was exposed, her legs straddled and thrusted against a motionless man on the floor. I struck her with a bottle as I passed, feeling a vibrating, blunt impact. She squealed before tumbling against the body. My heel struck a temple as it passed. A fat, middle-aged man stood next, clipping a cigar with his lips and grasping a whiskey bottle in each hand. He grinned as he turned to me, even as he watched my foot impact his belly, causing him to tower down. His bottles shattered as they hit chairs. I went to my knees and began to beat his face down. The thin bottle I held began to crack as it battered against the Johnny man's forehead. My last blow shattered it, leaving a reflective shard in the man's gaping head. I stood, holding onto a chair to steady my shaking figure. The cabin was almost silent. A few sounds were of moans, of pain or twisted pleasure. I scanned the seat near the back for anyone left living and saw a lone woman. She was also naked, scarred, bleeding from her arms, stomach and legs. She stared forward, unaware of my gaze toward her. A bolt of excitement ran through my chest. I felt excited and strut down the remaining aisle of carcasses, glass and stench of fluids. An inferno of senses had sent through my consciousness. Anticipation, stress, curiosity, relief. But no regret or guilt. I lashed my hand out at the helpless woman. But a strap of firm, leathery material coiled around my neck. It tugged back, tripping me to the ground. I looked up at the woman, who was now looking above me. She smiled at whatever was holding me, and began to reach her hand down to her leg. I felt at my throat, and sensed the strap portion of a seatbelt. Someone was on top of me, as I could feel from her pressure. The seatbelt tightened, constricting the last of my air. My struggle grew weak, and my vision followed. The glow of red transitioned into a cover of black. A ringing took over the sounds of my croaks and squeals. The flames that had rampaged through me had been stomped out. A nudge to the shoulder woke me. I could hear a voice, but my eyes remained shut out of fear. Sir, said a calm female voice, can you please get up, sir? I opened my eyes to a lit, plain cabin. A clean, normal sight startled me, in which I darted my head left and right. The cabin was empty of other passengers, and the lights were a standard white. The sounds of air vents could be heard across the ceiling, and all the windows remained shut. Standing above me to the right was a flight attendant. The flight attendant. Sir, we must ask you to leave now she said. You can exit from the front door. I stared at her for a brief moment. She held a blank expression. 
What is it that I just went through? I asked in a slurred, tired voice. Where am I? The same place you were when you stepped in, and I can't answer any of your other questions. Now please leave, or I'll have to request security. Uh, alright, okay. I stood, surprised by my own energy and consciousness. The attendant turned from me and went to a default position at the front of the cabin. The seats that lined the aisle were now vacant. No belongings were left behind, nor were there any other traces of passengers. The boarding tunnel was brighter, with a terminal visible from the exit. I paused in my step as the attendant spoke. Thank you for flying with us, sir, she said. We hope to see you back. I passed by the flight attendant without a glance back. The boarding tunnel's light was still dimmed, but the terminal appeared normal. As I travelled through the solemn corridor, I trembled as my memories began to collect. Hazy but dark images chilled my chest to the heart. But I couldn't help but sense a form of release. The experiences of the flight, whether real or hallucinated, thought about a strange comparison to my own life. My notable sin had now become trivial. As I exited the boarding tunnel, I stopped at the gate. A crowd of passengers, at least 40, lined up at the gate. They were conversing, their faces lit with excited, impatient expressions. I stepped out of their way looking back as the crowd began to pile into the tunnel. I read the gate ticker. The flight was still going east. There is a way you can bring back a loved one after death. I wouldn't recommend it though. Death is final and cheating it always leads to bad results. But, you'll want to know anyway. Well, here you go. Go to the cemetery that your loved one is buried in. This only works for those who've been buried. Though there's probably another method for cremation or something, but I don't know it. Make sure that you take the one material object that is most important to you with you. The emotion from this object, this sacrifice, will provide your power. Take it to the plot of your loved one and bury it over their grave. You don't have to go very far down, so don't worry about running into a slab or anything. Before you cover up the hole with your object, don't forget to add a few drops of your blood to it. This imbues the ritual with your own life essence and draws them in. Then comes the final steps. Take a small handful of dirt from where you buried your object and swallow it. Disgusting, but necessary. This creates the link between you and where you need to go. After that, get yourself as comfy as you can and fall asleep upon the grave. If everything was done correctly, and you get a bit lucky, you'll awaken to find yourself standing at the gate of the graveyard. It will be dim, foggy, and you'll notice a lack of colour in this drab place. You'll also see that there seem to be people wandering around the gravestones. Exactly how many, and what they'll look like, will depend on the cemetery you went to. But... I've never heard of a location not having at least a few dozen of them wandering around. Whatever you do, stay away from them. These are the shades of those left behind from failed rituals or weak spirits drawn from the surrounding areas to the power of your blood and object. Even if you recognize some of them, do not go near them. They are little more than instinct now and desire one thing above all else, life. They want another chance to live and crave nothing more 
even if the Shade's mind is so far gone, it doesn't even recall why. And if one catches you, it will try to steal that life away from you. They may notice you, they may not. If they do, evade them. It shouldn't be too hard, as their reflexes and control are not nearly as sharp as they used to be. Avoid them and look for your loved one. The person may be at their grave or wandering the walkway. You may even find them hiding, terrified of the scene before them. When you finally see your loved one, stop. Don't go near them yet. Call out the person's name and wait. If the response seems genuine, everything is going as planned. If the response is delayed, quiet, distant, or not even present, then hold on. Ask from a distance. What was the one thing the person hated in life? As these shades progress and their minds dwindle to nothing, some of the first things to go are the memories of the things they hated in life. Any bad memory that makes life seem terrible would slip away to be replaced by that deep desire to return to the living. If your loved one's answer seems legitimate, take their hand and pray that you weren't wrong. If you are, you may find yourself as a replacement shade wandering this foggy graveyard. Be aware, their hand will be cold, freezing, like grasping solid ice. But never let go. Even if your hand starts going numb and your fingers turn black, do not let go. After feeling the rush of life touching their hand and immediately losing it moments later, your loved one may not be able to resist the urge to take it all from you. Take your loved one back to the gate, avoiding the other shades as you can. More may notice you now, as your living body is connected to their realm via your lost loved one. Be quick, be decisive, and do not let go of your loved one's hand. Should you make it and step through the gate of the cemetery, you'll find yourself back in the living world. However, this time, your loved one will have rejoined you at your side, still clutching your hand. To the rest of the world, it will just seem like your loved one went on a long trip somewhere and recently came back. Nobody will be able to recall where it was they went or what they did there. Well, nobody except you and your loved one. But they will be happy to see the person's return. After this... I suggest that you never stay in one place too long. Keep moving, keep roaming. The more random your journeys, the better. The moment you start to see the sickly, pale look come over your loved one's face, or the bit of decay that might start forming on your skin, move. Death hates to be cheated, and if he catches up with you and your loved one, he will make sure that you both feel every bit of the rotting sickness that will build up in your bodies until your loved one once again falls to the grasp of death and returns to the cemetery. This time, however, they won't be alone. You will be joining them. Maybe you'll get lucky though. Maybe someone might make this journey for you. They will take your hand and drag you back to the world of the living, only for it all to start over once again. Have you ever visited Edinburgh? Beautiful city. No matter what time of year you go, the castle that sits at the center of the city is awe-inspiring, looking down on the surrounding area from the mount. The peaks and valleys of the land have resulted in a city 
that flows with the landscape. Streets that surround can be steep, with the numerous sprawling alleyways even steeper. It is here that we find the flesh market clothes. It could be mistaken for any other darkened causeway in the city. It sits among the shops and tourist traps, relatively non-threatening, and can be used as a shortcut to get down to the station if you are in a hurry. The name has been justified through some who point out that flesh markets were a local term for butchers, and through others who suggested a hangout of women of the first vocation. These are incorrect. There is a market on the clothes, but flesh is not the product. It is the currency. Market hours are dusk until dawn, and the entrance fee is one mouthful of your own blood. Prepare a glass and regress down the alleyway. As you get halfway down, swig from the glass and spit it against the wall. The blood will bubble and spread across the wall, coagulating into a hardened scab. This will then start to flake and scatter. A rather anticlimactic door will be revealed beneath. Stepping through is disorienting, as logic will tell you you are stepping into a building. The space you are stepping into has no walls, with darkness shrouding the edges. It is at the penumbra that a number of stalls are set up, run by individuals who look like market traders from across the globe, from Arabian merchants to Cockney grocers to New York street conmen. All of their clothes are splattered with blood and offal. These figures will entice you to come speak with them and will gesture to numerous signs around their stalls regarding the sales they are currently having. Upon approaching one of the stalls, they will start to pressure you to make a deal with them. You are certainly welcome to do so, and the products that are available are certainly worth consideration. Starting at the cheap end of the spectrum, you may wish to offer one breath. A longful will net you knowledge of the weather for the next day. In itself, a rather pointless purchase in the age of smartphones and the Met Office, but centuries ago, invaluable. Taking this offer will result in the seller reaching out with his hand flattened, then quickly grasping it into a fist. The air will literally be stolen from your lungs and cause a few moments of gasping as you catch your breath. Are you attached to your fingers? How attached? I mean, do you reckon you could do without your little finger? This sale will provide you instant forgiveness from any one person you desire for any wrongs you may have encroached against them. Agreeing to do this one will cause the trader to grin and shout, One Yubitsubi special, coming right up. They will lunge forward and grab your wrist, pinning it to the table. Don't resist, because no one likes a tough sell. A flash of steel, and you'll be minus one digit. Remember, you can only pay twice. Now, make no mistake, it will hurt. There will probably be a lot of blood, and if you don't take care of the wound, you may even get infected. As the price goes up, you may want to consider taking precautions regarding what you trade. Tourniquets and suches would certainly not go amiss. Now, some of the traders will seem familiar and may hark back to stories and legends that have existed for millennia. This is the influence the market has on our culture, leeching in over the centuries. A pound of flesh will make it impossible for the next person you make a trade with to renege on the deal, especially useful if you don't trust the company you keep. It has no use within the market, as all of the traders here are trustworthy, and will honour a purchase to the letter and the spirit. Best to leave this transaction until last. How about one of your eyes? Depth perception is overrated anyway. Offering up one of them will allow you to converse with our avian friends. You will be able to call down the birds from the trees, and they will be able to answer any questions you may have. 
It is advisable you avoid ravens. They have their own agenda, and it is not in your best interests. The salesman will grab you around the throat and slowly prise his fingers into the socket. A snap of the wrist and your visual organ will rest in their palm. Another snap, and it will disappear. It is at this point where you may want to consider stronger measures to ensure your survival of payment. In this strange little world of ours, the market is hardly the strangest. Artifacts and incantations exist that can allow the body to continue to function long past the point at which mortal coils would be shuffled from. One or two can be picked up here, but few are willing to live without their sexual organs. It seems eternity is a little bit colder without the ability to get your rocks off. I'm not going to go into the detail of how they are taken. Suffice to say that it is unpleasant and messy. At this point, the price has become a little more vital. What would you take for your stomach? In this deal, it would merit you the ability to understand the desires of anyone you talk to. Whilst you converse with them, your mind will be filled with the images of what they covet the most. This would provide a significant advantage to any budding salesman, and the deal has been taken up by several still holders themselves. Some may argue that such a gift would be more poetically suited to the heart. That vascular muscle, however, is a part of an altogether different deal. By bartering with your heart, you can guarantee the happiness of any given individual for the rest of their life, however long that may be. The removal of these types of organs can be significantly painful, but the dealer will allow you a moment to prepare yourself before they produce a short, keen blade. One practice swipe later, and they will be digging into your tissue. They have unnerving accuracy and a level of cleanliness that rivals any surgeon. Now, it is acknowledged in some places that once the deal has been sealed, a buyer may have second thoughts and may want to back out. This is not one of those places. Most of the contract is left unspoken, but you are expected to have done your research. The buyout clauses are a killer. Whilst most of the body can be put on the table, there are limitations. The fact of the matter is that the brain is the seat of sentience and cannot be fully placed in. I say fully. There was one individual who offered to lobotomize the part of the brain that holds memory as part of the deal. The problem is, he cannot remember what it is he received in return. I hear he suffered night terrors for the rest of his days. Now, at this point, I offer a warning. Up until now, I have detailed the price list for your own body parts. Whatever you do, do not attempt to purchase anything in the market with organs of another. Every figure in the market will stop and stare at you. And the one you attempt to defraud will scream, That is not yours to trade. Whatever it is you have tried to barter with, that body part will be taken from you as punishment. A very literal eye for an eye. Despite whatever theological perspectives you may hold, offering your own soul will elicit the same result. There have been many theories postulated for this response, but the honest answer is, we just don't know. The market has been trading in blood and bone for as long as civilization has existed, though the entrance has moved from city to city. Many have visited and shook hands with the butchers, though not quite as many get those hands back. A smart man would wonder how it is these individuals are capable of honoring the deals they broker. A smarter man would ask himself why his body parts are of such high value in this economy. Just understand that it is supply and demand, and as long as there are fools willing to supply, you shouldn't need to concern yourself 
with who it is doing the demanding. If you want to lose your grasp on reality and destroy your complete sanity, just listen to the clock. But this will not be easy, let me tell you right now. This is not something to mess around with. It's just an easy way to lose your mind within the confines of your own home. But there are a couple of guidelines to follow. First, pick a room with no windows. It can be any room for anything, but it just can't have windows. Second, you can start at any time in the day, even if you wish to start at night, but the process will take exactly 24 hours to complete. Third, cancel all appointments you have for that day, turn off your phone if you have to, for there can't be any distractions for you to focus on. Fourth, Make sure it is a calm and quiet day outside, and not windy or storming outside. Lastly, to start the process, you must go into the room you picked, put a clock inside. The clock must make the distinct tick-tock sound when every second passes. Turn off the lights and light a candle. That candle will be your only source of light. Once you have done all of that, I honestly want you to ask yourself one question. Do I really want to do this? If your answer is yes, may God have mercy on you. I'm here to merely prepare you on what to expect. Alright, let me tell you a little bit of information about the procedure. Back in the mid-1800s, radical members of the Christian Muslim and Islamic faith used it as a way to connect with God. It was kept under wraps due to its extreme nature, an unusual method to connect with the supernatural. The clock represented life on earth and how short it can be, and the candle represented God as the only way of guidance through life. Most often than not, each person that would go through the procedure would lose their minds and within a day, and due to their insane actions, would kill themselves from what they claimed to have seen. But if you were one of the lucky ones, you can keep your sanity, like me. Okay, now, here is what to expect. The first three hours are the least eventful, mainly because nothing really happens. But prepare yourself in these hours. These are the only hours in which you may choose to leave the procedure. In the fourth hour, you will not be able to escape by any means. The lock in your door will lock by itself, and you will have no way to move it. In the fifth hour, you will start to sweat profusely, and will start to have feelings of anxiety. You will start to look behind you many times, and every time, there will be nothing there. In the sixth hour, you will hear noises. Not noises from the house or from outside, but thuds and thumps throughout the hour in 10 minute intervals, with each noise getting louder. In the seventh hour, you will pass out and dream, but this will be the only pleasant hour throughout the process. You will dream about the best moments in your life Every great accomplishment, wonderful memory, and friends you have made will appear before you. It will have been the best dream you have ever had in your life. Even events from the future can appear. At the beginning of the eighth hour, you shall wake up. But when you do, you will feel an extreme sense of elation and comfort, similar to the effects of smoking marijuana. Now, for some, 
this could be considered another pleasant hour. But what comes after will be the start of your suffering. In the ninth hour, you will, in a sense, go from one drug to another. Your feelings of elation will change to that of extreme adrenaline and energy, similar to the effects of any stimulant drug. But a warning, you must try your hardest to keep yourself under control. You are unpredictable. There is no telling what you will do in this state. In the tenth hour, hopefully you will have minimal injuries from the last hour. But now you will start to feel normal. And your feelings you previously felt will subside. Now you will hear screaming. The screaming can vary from what it sounds like from a little girl to a full grown man. You will hear screaming at six minute intervals throughout the hour. This hour is going to feel like an eternity to pass. At the eleventh hour, the light from the candle will go out. That's it. You are left alone in the darkness. You are free to think to yourself, most likely regretting the decision you have made. At the twelfth hour, the light from the candle will reappear. But do not worry, this is another hour of silence. But mentally prepare yourself for what you are about to experience. In the thirteenth hour, you shall pass out, much like you did in the seventh hour. But don't expect happy memories. In this dream, you shall experience every painful moment, suffering, an unpleasant thing in your life all over again. Even suffering in the future, including your own death. This will be the worst dream you will ever have in your life. At the fourteenth hour, you will wake up. This is another hour of silence, but the silence will be broken by your own sobbing. The tears shall continue until the hour is over. In the fifteenth hour, this is putting it very bluntly, is when things start to get weird. You will talk to someone. He is not visible, but he is there. He doesn't have a name, but I am giving him one. He is your guardian angel. But you can call him Watcher or Protector. But for me, I call him Asshole. This may seem funny, but trust me, it suits him. The first thing he will say to you is, Ask me anything, and I shall give you an answer. You can ask him anything about your life. What will happen in the future, and why events occurred, and when they did. He will give you an answer but extreme and graphic details, and give reasons for things you will not understand, whether it be a tragedy or a death. By the end of the hour, you will say farewell and leave. In the sixteenth hour, you will talk to your parents, but they do not make a physical appearance, mind you. Now it's your turn to answer questions. They will ask you questions about what you have done with your life, and if you do not answer one of their questions, they will press on for an answer until you can't take it anymore. At the end of the hour, they will go away. At the seventeenth hour, you will talk to the most important guy in your life, whether it be your significant other or your best friend. He will ask you why and how you became friends, but keep in mind, he is not looking for friendly conversation. He is questioning your friendship with him, finding every mistake you have done to cripple your friendship with him. Reasoning with him will not work, and will act like your parents did in the previous hour. At the eighteenth hour, you will speak to the most important girl of your life, whether it be your significant other or your best friend. She will do the same as the person in the seventeenth hour did, and ask the same questions. At the nineteenth hour, you will talk with yourself, meaning 
you will talk with your future self. And trust me, this is the least pleasant conversation. He will tell you things you will not want to hear about yourself. He will ask you questions you can and can't answer. Soon it will be too much and you will find yourself screaming at yourself and anger and self-loathing will be the only emotion you will have. In the 20th hour, following the events of the 19th hour, you will find any possibility to hurt yourself. Self-inflicting pain will be constant in this hour. Some have even committed suicide at this point. In the 21st hour, if you have managed to survive the previous hour, here is what will await you. Music. Yes, music. It will be soft orchestral music, with a choir singing a Gregorian chant, similar to church music, but more beautiful. By the end of this hour, your wounds will heal. Don't ask me why, even I don't know. In the 22nd hour, the music will stop. This is another hour of silence, but you have time to think to yourself. The light on the candle will change colours, all colours of the spectrum. This is quite a sight to behold. It's almost soothing. In the 23rd hour, you will sing the Gregorian chant, but your singing will be the only sound in the room. You honestly don't know what you're singing, but it sounds beautiful, and you will actually want to sing more. Finally, the 24th hour. This is the most interesting hour. Rumor says you talk to God himself, but here is how it goes. You are pinned to the floor by some unknown force, and someone or something asks you a question at 10 minute intervals. Questions like, are you happy? Or, would you like to change? You must answer. You will feel the need to. The questioner sounds like a man, but at the same time sounds like an animal, almost like the roar of a lion. His voice is terrifying, but yet comforting at the same time. After the hour is up, you will be able to get up the door will unlock. If you're lucky, you still have your sanity. Now, it is up to you what you shall do with this information. If you want to do this, I'm not stopping you. But I'm giving you a fair warning. Some things are beyond the realms of human comprehension. And sometimes, you just have nothing to explain the unnatural. But, Whatever it is, at least we know we are not alone. Now remember what I have told you. If you want to lose your grasp on reality and destroy your complete sanity, just listen to the clock.